Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, uh, all of you for the third day of the annual Municipal Finance Conference. Uh, my name is Justin Marlowe, and I'm a professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to uh, kick things off here today, provide a couple opening remarks about where we've been and uh, where we're going with today's conference proceedings. Thanks again, all of you, for tuning in. Uh, the last couple of days have been really remarkable. Our first day was focused more on uh, fiscal policy questions and with a lot of emphasis on COVID and the uh, COVID response from a fiscal perspective. We were also really lucky to have a, a really terrific panel uh, regarding the G, the governance in ESG on that first day. Yesterday, if you were able to tune in, we had a little, little more emphasis on the kind of technical muni market uh, granular sorts of questions and some really interesting work on fund flows and issuer behavior. Uh, lots of great stuff there for those that are focused a little bit more on the ins and outs of the municipal bond market. And we were lucky to have a really wonderful panel on Puerto Rico and where Puerto Rico has been and where it's going. Certainly a top of mind topic for those of us who follow the muni market and a lot of the fiscal policy surrounding the muni market. Today, uh, we're going to round out our focus on ESG. Uh, in the morning, we're going to have, or for first, I should say, we have a panel on the S in ESG, and that'll be followed by uh, a panel on the E in ESG, S, of course, being social considerations and the E being environmental consideration. And then after that, we will wrap things up uh, with what promises to be a really terrific panel on infrastructure spending, particularly the federal response, uh, how that response is playing out at the state and local level and, and what we can expect there. Uh, so top to bottom, just a really, really terrific program. And, and today is keeping with all of that. As always, we want to, before we get started, thank everyone who helps make this possible, uh, the Hutchins Center and all the staff there, uh, David, Stephanie, Howen, everyone who's involved in, in making the conference go. Thanks, as always. Thanks, of course, to our advisory board and everyone who's involved in helping us to assemble the program. And uh, of course, thanks to all of my, my co-sponsors, uh, WashU, Brandeis, and of course the, the Hutchins Center at Brookings. So with that, uh, now that we've got the, the context set for the day, again, wonderful panel focused on uh, the S in ESG. And to make that happen, I'll turn things over to uh, our colleague, Carol Leclerc again. Carol, welcome. And uh, we'll give the proceedings to you. Thank you. Um, I, I thought I had unmuted. Great. Um, we have two back-to-back uh, -back papers here. Um, so this session really consists of two uh, different sessions. Each paper will be a 15-minute presentation followed by about a 10-minute discussant and then a, a further 10 minutes for a follow-up. Um, and I think we should start first with um, the first paper, which is Black Tax Evidence of Racial Discrimination in Municipal Borrowing Costs. The authors are Ashley Eldermer at the University of Tennessee, Kimberly Luchtenberg from American University, and Matthew Winter at Stony Brook University, who's going to be presenting. And uh, after his presentation, the discussant will be Casey Dougal from Florida State. So Matthew, it's over to you. All right, thank you. I am going to share my screen. Can everyone see my slides and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. My name is Matthew Winter. Uh, this is truly an honor. We as academics work on so many questions and it's really a privilege and a blessing to have the opportunity to hear from so many market participants that uh, the work you're doing is relevant. So what do we do? We have our overview and our key finding. Our main finding is that cities and counties with higher percentages of black residents pay higher borrowing costs. So for a one percentage point increase, in the percentage of black residents within a city or county, we find an increase of about 0.44 basis points in total annualized cost. This is surprising for a number of reasons. First, 
the typical county within our sample has a black population of around 7.4%. So we're talking about a relatively small share of a city or county's residents being associated with an increase in borrowing costs. Second, within our setting, we're looking at rated direct offers. And because we have access to a rating, economic theory would suggest that I would pay less attention to racial demographics because I already have a good way of identifying the credit risk of the municipality. The way that we're comparing is by using state by year fixed effects. So we're comparing cities and counties that issue within the same state in the same year. And we're gonna face several empirical challenges. First is endogeneity. Where black residents are located in America is not random. Second, it's difficult to measure taste. It's really challenging to measure racial resentment, to measure racial bias. So we'll use different measures from the literature and we'll take an approach that hopefully takes advantage of time variation within levels of racial resentment. And third, even if you do find that there is evidence of racial bias, it could be statistical discrimination, meaning that the way municipalities with higher percentages of Black residents enter capital markets leads, to, leads them to offer issues that market participants would price lower. So it could be that these are riskier, that these are less liquid, et cetera. So we'll go through a number of steps to try to deal with these different challenges. And our big takeaway is that we basically find using an instrument variable from 1980, it's hard to argue that where black residents were in 1980 should matter to me in 2015 or 2016, how much a bond should cost. Second, we'll use different measures of racial resentment. We'll try to use time variation in racial resentment. We'll use all the controls from the literature and our big punchline is that we don't think this is endogenous. We do think that market structure plays a big role. And we also find evidence of mispricing when we look at the Latino population, which we consider to be an out of sample test because most of our measures of racial resentment are focused on blacks in America. So our punchline is that limited competition can enable racial bias to influence municipal bond prices. There's considerable evidence that racial bias can reduce financial inclusion in credit markets. So there's work done by Casey and co-authors that shows that historically black colleges and universities pay higher borrowing costs, even amongst AAA rated issuers. There's also considerable evidence that minority borrowers pay higher car loan rates despite having lower default rates. And there's evidence all across the country of black homes being devalued Black owner homes that are owned by Black residents being devalued. Within our setting of municipalities, there's sort of two ways that we think about this. The first is that racial bias can influence the way that the municipality is perceived by the credit market. And the second is that racial bias can influence the way the municipality accesses the credit market. So there's work done by Alicina and co-authors that shows that there's lower voter support for spending on public goods when minorities are expected to be the beneficiaries of those goods. What that leads to are fewer bond elections and larger offers because you have to build coalitions in order to get these bonds put forward in the first place. Those larger offers from the perspective of an investor can be considered less liquid because within the municipal bond market, unlike our other capital markets, we have many smaller markets in which your marginal investor is far more likely to be locally concentrated. So if I'm facing a really large offer, to me, as a, as a market participant, this could really um, come with a pricing discount because of the liquidity implications. So the thing that we wanna make clear is that there's no evidence that having a racially diverse municipality is associated with the municipality being riskier in terms of a credit rating. There is evidence that racial bias can influence the way that you access the capital market. So an example, the data that we use in the paper is from SDC, but this is from Emma, our friends at Emma, we all know Emma. It's publicly available data, and I think this is a good illustrative example of the sort of mechanism we're describing. So this is from North Carolina from the year 2001. You can sort by coupon to see who's paying the most. What you observe is there's two counties. There's Wake County and there's Brunswick County. So Wake County is much larger, has a considerably higher share of Black residents, 21 versus Brunswick, which has a little bit less than 10%. You can also observe that Wake County's issuance is 150 million versus Brunswick, which is 38 million. What's surprising to us, on paper, Wake County should be paying lower, all things held equal between these two. So these are bonds that are issued just two months apart, virtually the same maturity. Wake County's issuance is AAA rated. It's got nearly a million people, much higher median income, much higher income per capita, but yet it's still paying more to issue this bond. Now, 
the way that we think about this more generally within our economic setting is we're going to go a step further. We're going to look at rated direct offers. So these are all offers that have a rating. We're going to link this to U.S. Census data. And the key idea is with rated bonds that are directly associated with cities and counties, all things held equal, as a market participant, I shouldn't really be caring about racial demographics because I know what the bond is rated. And there are going to be different ways that discrimination can operate within the setting. So there's taste-based, which is gonna argue that it's really not that having a higher proportion of black residents makes you riskier. It's that there's some level of racial resentment amongst market participants such that these issuances that are associated with your municipality aren't really sought after. There's also gonna be statistical-based. Now, the idea behind statistical-based is that all things held equal, the way in which markets participants are coming to these bonds, it's going to result in them having a lower price, a larger discount, regardless of racial demographics. So if it's a riskier, less liquid, if the maturity is weird, all types of stuff. The important point that we want to stress again and again is there's no credit rating evidence that diverse municipalities are riskier. If anything, within our sample, the municipalities with higher percentages of Black residents look less risky. They have larger population, higher employment, higher income per capita. And there's also no evidence that these ratings that are associated with racially diverse municipalities are done incorrectly. There's one study that looked at this in Virginia by, by Do It All in 1996, and they really didn't find evidence that there were differences in downgrades with these credit ratings. So here's a snapshot of our data. The key economic point is that when you look below and above median, you can observe that the above median counties in terms of black population are larger, higher income, higher employment, and there also tend to be in places with higher levels of racial resentment. So that's also gonna present a little bit of an empirical challenge for us, which is why we'll try to use time variation in these levels of racial resentment. Okay, so what do we do? We predict that a higher percentage of black residents increases annualized total costs due to racial bias. And as we said, the literature has shown us that this can happen in different ways. One way that this can happen is through the taste of market participants. So we'll use measures of racial resentment. We'll also look for time periods of changing national and local levels of racial resentment. The other way is statistical. Statistical argues that it's not really about market participants harboring racial resentment. It's that you're issuing bonds that are riskier or that are larger or that all things held equal are going to make it so that as an investor, I need a bigger price discount regardless of your racial demographics. These are very difficult things to identify. So how are we going to attempt to identify them? Well, for statistical, we're going to use all the things that we have from the literature. So our standard credit risk controls, we're going to use offering size to look at liquidity, and we'll split bonds by maturity, by bond years to get some sense of all the different ways that an investor would profile an issuance. For taste, we're going to follow the literature. So we're going to use different measures of racial resentment. One is from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study. The other are racist tweets following Obama's second election. And the main idea is to identify states in which residents display higher levels of racial resentment as identified by these measures. We're also going to be trying to use time variation in racial resentment. And so for this, we're really relying a lot on the political science literature and also on social science and survey evidence. There is survey evidence that there were changing levels of racial resentment coinciding with the election cycles of Obama and also of President Trump. So we're going to take advantage of that. There's also political science literature that shows that when you have a local election, a gubernatorial election, there are concerns of scarcity that become much more salient to residents. And those have been shown to be periods in which racial resentment and racial bias becomes more pronounced. So we're going to try to use all of this as different ways of teasing out these different effects. Lastly, we will take a look at market structure, specifically state tax privilege. The idea being that I'm going to be looking at some markets in which I'm likely to face a national pool of investors and some in which I'll face a local pool of investors. And when I face only a local pool of investors of residents within my state, because I get a big tax privilege, it's far more likely that our local preferences are going to be priced into this market. And then we're not going to show this, but we do show that it's robust to some of the things that have been shown in the literature, like bankruptcy protection, tax adjustments, et cetera. Okay, so our main regression. On our left-hand side, we've got total annualized cost. On our right-hand side, we've got the lagged Black population for the city or county. And then we have our standard controls. So we control for characteristics of the county. We control for characteristics of the bond. Because we know there might be this 
coalition building. We also put in an indicator for four more QSIPs packaged together in the same issue. And then lastly, we have state by year fixed effects because again, we want to account for any local effects, any local policy changes, and we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Same bond issued from the same state and the same or same same state, same year, not the same bond. Okay, so all of our errors are going to be clustered by county and by year. So what do we see? Our main result. What we show is that for a county compared to the other issuers within your same state and year, a one percentage point increase in your black population is associated with a 0.44 basis increase in your borrowing costs. So as we go from column to column, we're including now more and more controls. And we basically see that including all of the various controls that plenty aren't listed here, it doesn't really seem to affect the economic magnitude of what we're showing. We also show that the effect gets even stronger when we use our instrument variable, which is the black population from 1980. And again, it's difficult to argue how 1980 and 2015 or 2016 are one and the same. So we think this is a good instrument because it's going to capture some of the stuff that we want and leave some of the endogeneity that we're afraid of. What do we do next? Having had established that black that cities and counties with higher percentages of black residents pay higher borrowing costs, we next want to assess what role, if any, does racial resentment play in this effect? So we're using tercials, we're splitting states into tercials into groups of three, and we're comparing states that have high levels of high levels of racial resentment versus lower levels of racial resentment. Our first measure is from the Cooperative Congressional Survey, and what we show is that this pricing penalty is largely concentrated in states that have higher levels of racial resentment. We find similar effects when we look at racist tweets following the election of President Obama. Again, these are different ways of looking at levels of racial resentment, and we kind of find the same effect. So having had established that taste seems to play a role, we also know that there are going to be differences in the way in which racially diverse municipalities access this capital market. So we're trying to now assess statistical discrimination. So we're still using all those same bond controls, but now we're splitting samples by offering characteristics. What we're showing here in the presentation is when we split by offer size. So what you observe, hopefully, is that all of this pricing penalty, most of it is concentrated in large offers. When we do a double sort to control for these different levels of racial resentment and also offer size, we observe that it's mostly concentrated in places that have high levels of racial resentment. So as we saw from the example with Wake County and as we've seen from the example within the data, we know that racially diverse Black municipalities with higher percentages of Black residents are going to be much more inclined to have larger bond issuances. And that's where the pricing penalty is coming in. But we know that it's entirely concentrated in places with higher levels of racial resentment. So next, we want to assess what role does the market structure in a different way play in this effect. So here we're looking at tax privilege. We, so, we show that consistent with what you might expect, the effects are stronger in places that have higher levels of tax privilege and higher levels of racial resentment. Lastly, we want to figure out, is there a way to identify time variation in racial resentment? So what do we do? We're going to take advantage of presidential elections and gubernatorial elections. The elections of President Obama and President Trump coincided with changing levels of racial resentment, according to survey evidence. So we would expect what we find, which is that during the elections of Obama, the election cycles, we see a decrease in this pricing penalty. And during the election of President Trump, that election cycle, we see an increase in this pricing penalty. So it's consistent with what the survey evidence would suggest. And importantly, we see that these differences, these changing in prices are coming from places that have higher level of racial resentment, having less of a pricing penalty during the election cycles of Obama, and places with lower levels of racial resentment, having a higher pricing penalty during the election cycle of President Trump. So it seems to be like there's changing levels of racial resentment. And that's important. We also know that because it's hard to say with just three elections, whether this is driven by a red state versus blue state thing, let's take a look at gubernatorial elections. And importantly, we show that you observe these same pricing penalties in places that have elected Democrats and Republicans. So it doesn't really seem to be that this is about uh, red state versus blue state. And this is much more considered uh, something that we think is robust to the various, elect the various political structures of the US. Lastly, 
we take a look to see whether or not this pricing penalty is only something that we observe for Black residents, and the answer is no. In the data, Latino residents are coded as Hispanic. When we use the Hispanic population, we also find a pricing penalty that is there. So what's our takeaway? Our evidence suggests that the marginal investors' taste and the municipal bonds market structure can increase municipal borrowing costs. We find evidence of a pricing penalty that's associated with Black residents. Black residents make up a relatively small share of a typical municipality. And this is a large national, large national sample. We're looking all across the US over a large time span. And we find this, and it's fairly robust. We think the mispricing is higher in periods of increased racial resentment and also in states with more segmented markets. And our evidence is consistent with racial bias reducing financial inclusion in credit markets, as has been shown by Casey, by Ravana, and by many, many others. So uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. That was uh, huge and encyclopedic. And I'm now going to ask. Um, Casey Dougal from Florida State for his uh, reactions to this. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Matthew. I really enjoyed the paper and the presentation and thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, so this paper, uh, looks to establish the existence of a black tax. What it finds is that municipal borrowing costs increase with the percentage of municipality population that is black. So how big is the effect? Um, so a 10% increase in the percentage of the black population, which is roughly equivalent to say a standard deviation increase, say moving from 10% black population to 20% black population, increases annual costs by about five basis points. And that's relative to average issuance costs by about 200 of 270 uh, basis points. Or in dollar terms for the average bond, which has a face value of $24 million and a maturity of 15 years, uh, the black tax is equivalent to about $18,000 over the life of the bond. Or to make it even more concrete, DC has a population that's 45% black, Baltimore has a population that's 63% black. So were you to issue say the same bond in DC and Baltimore, holding everything else equal, you'd have to pay about 10 basis points higher in Baltimore than DC. Is 10 basis points big or not? I mean, it just depends on your perspective. I was talking to a muni bond professional at lunch a couple of days ago, and he'd said he'd sell his mother for 10 basis points. So just depends. Um, now, and this seems to be in line with uh, uh, other research that's done in the past, so Berkshire, Escher, Cohen, and Chennai finds uh, effects of roughly similar magnitudes. And so I'll kind of offer my comments as I go. So my first comment is kind of relative to the method they used to establish the existence of this tax. And so I call it the kind of kitchen sink method. Essentially, it's uh, OLS regressions with issuance costs as the dependent variable, uh, controlling for the percentage of the issuer or the municipality black population, and then the rest of the kitchen sink. Um, so all, all the things that could be uh, correlated with issuance cost. And so the first comment I would have is, uh, if you're gonna include the kitchen sink, there's a few things you probably also ought to include. Uh, two things that in particular is uh, some control for underwriter efficiency. And so this is an alternative story that uh, the Berkshire paper kind of uh, discussed. So you can control for something like underwriter fixed effects or underwriter experience. Um, the control for the possibility that potentially that uh, high black population municipalities are maybe using less efficient underwriters. Uh, another thing that we found that is relatively important for issuance costs is the usage of a financial advisor. All right, my second point is it'd be interesting at some point to see uh, results where you discretize the percentage of the black population to see if there's nonlinear effects. So do we see that the black tax kind of increases monotonically with the proportion of black people in a municipality, or is it driven primarily by say the tail? Is it driven by primarily by areas that have very high black populations? Um, uh, third comment relative to the methodology is, in the regressions, there doesn't appear to be any relationship between the offering amount and issuance costs. So you, you estimate a, a coefficient on the offering amount that's, that's roughly zero. It's probably subsumed by county demographics that you do control for, but it's kind of surprising because most papers do find a very strong connection there. I only mention that because it does seem like there's might be something going on where black population, bond size, 
area population, there's, they're kind of confounding effects. So for example, when you look um, on the characteristics of bonds issued by below median uh, black population areas versus above median, we see that below median areas issue maybe 14,000 bonds versus 52,000 bonds. Average population for below median areas is 274,000 versus 851,000 for above median. Average size is 14 million for below median, 26 million for above median. From these results, what I kind of get is uh, kind of just uh, evidence that black people tend to live more in cities than in rural areas. And so what my concern is, is that it's potentially the percentage of black population is actually a, a kind of a proxy for this urban versus rural sort. So you do control for county population, but maybe it's say controlling for say population density or something like that. I would feel much better with the results if, if you did some sort of uh, matching estimator. So match counties on demographics and then look for the, the tax, the black tax within kind of the match. Um, another issue where I was kind of just confused about page five, it says to focus on the least opaque bonds, which would most appeal to institutional investors, we restrict our analysis to rated deals. Um, and then in table two, it says uh, only 16% of issues have long-term rating. So I was kind of confused. Do you have a rating for each issue? Um, and if so, are you controlling for it? Or do you only have the long-term issuer rating? And then if you do, I know you have the long-term issuer rating, the regressions, I'd probably prefer you to use kind of a dummy variables rather than say continuous variable in that instance, since uh, you know, there might be some uh, moving from rating bucket to rating bucket might have different effect on costs. Um, so you establish the existence of the effect. Next, you look to explain it. Uh, primary looking at discrimination based uh, reasons. Um, so there's two main economic models of discrimination. The first being say taste based discrimination. Uh, in this instance, the, the black tax would be due to buyers just simply disliking black people and by extension black areas and the, the bonds they issue. And so this was kind of our, the finding in our paper. What we found is that um, when historically black colleges issued debt, um, it was harder for the underwriters to find buyers for this, for this debt. And so they charged more in issuance costs because it took them longer to find buyers. Um, when these bonds trade in the secondary market, they sat in dealer inventories for three days longer than say a similar non-HBCU blonde. Um, the alternative story is a statistical discrimination one where buyers simply believe that the percentage of the black population is a proxy for risk, credit risk, or some other kind of risk. Now, it's, it's interesting, municipal risk models can include county demographics. So if this is the case, it kind of suggests that their models might not be that good. Um, so unlike you say credit ratings for individuals where it's illegal to consider race, municipal bond models can consider this. Um, so uh, one way or the other, it is important to distinguish though because under taste-based discrimination, this is not optimal. Statistical discrimination, at least economically, you think this is profit optimal. Uh, uh, maximizing. Now the paper finds evidence for vote, both. It finds the tax, uh, black taxes higher in more racist areas, more racist time periods. It also finds uh, some evidence of statistical discrimination. Now, I think the statistical discrimination stuff is a little weaker. So I'm gonna focus more on the taste-based discrimination. Um, I think the strongest results are you find, you know, within lots of different subsamples uh, that the effect of the black tax is, is much higher in the most racist areas. My only caveat to these results is I'd like to see some formal statistical uh, test of the black tax between the high and the low areas, just to, to show that it's statistically different. Uh, you also have time series variation in racial animus. And it's interesting, when we wrote the, the HBCU paper, we had the, a similar idea to do a similar test, but for the exact opposite reason. And so I'm a little uh, less stoked about these results. And in particular, there's two reasons why. The first is, why, why do we think the Obama election would reduce the black tax? Well, there's two potential reasons. One, it reduced prejudice, or it could be that because Obama's election was correlated with expectations of favorable federal policies for black cities, which would then decrease the credit risk. I don't know how to distinguish between these two possibilities. Uh, and the other reason why I kind of don't like these tests is, it's kind of unclear if Obama election reduced or increased prejudice. And when I say that, I know that there's a lot of survey, is, evidence that the average population had it reduced prejudice, 
But what we really care about is the population that buys municipal bonds. And so, you know, originally we thought about doing this test and what we thought was that liquidity for these HBCU bonds would decrease uh, around the Obama election because we think that, you know, the uh, rich, white, older person might have increased prejudice with Obama being elected. We don't know, but I think that's, that's something to think about. Um, but I think whether or not to increase or decrease prejudice likely depends upon the survey population. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, but what, what I wanna say is I think the best test for the taste-based discrimination, which what I suggest doing is a subsample analysis uh, where you include insure fixed effects. So you look at only insured bonds, and then you include insured and fixed effects. And so you're essentially comparing bonds well, within, that were issued within the same year that insured by the same insurer. So we essentially shut down that credit risk channel. And so if you find the black tax there, then you absolutely know it had nothing to do with credit risk. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, you, 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 can, you can take half a minute if you want, because I also want to give um, Matthew a chance to get back to you, because I think it would be very good for you guys to have a little colloquy here. So finish yeah, I, Absolutely. And so I guess my final comment is finally, it, once you establish it, once you find the explanation, a little bit more on the mechanism would be nice. If you think it's taste-based discrimination, showing that these, uh, these uh, say, black city bonds have higher liquidity risk, or if it's statistical discrimination, why is it the statistical discrimination? Is it because uh, the, the percentage of black population is simply correlated with, say, city financials? Or is it discrimination at the municipality level? Is it something to do with you know, the potential for high, higher risk of social unrest? So for example, Matheson and Bade find that violent protests can cause a shortfall in municipal finances. So it could be the case that, you know, black and non-black cities, same finances, but maybe just the risk of the social unrest leads to higher credit risk. Or it could be something like discrimination at the state level where maybe black cities potentially are less likely to obtain financial help uh, from their state uh, when they encounter uh, fiscal difficulties. So figuring out why it's, what the mechanism is, I think would really push the paper kind of up another level. All right, thank you so much. No, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Casey. And I wanna give Matthew or any of his co-authors a chance to uh, respond to that. Go ahead, Matt. Casey, thank you so much for your discussion. It's very helpful. I, you can tell we were heavily influenced by your work, so it's good to hear your feedback. To answer the two or three things that we can kind of quickly, um, regarding the ratings, we do only include rated bonds. The difference is that some are from issuers with the long-term rating and some are from issuers without a long-term rating, but all of the deals are rated. So that's something that we'll clarify in the writing. With regard to the Obama and to the Trump test, we also shared your thought of like, is there a potential reverse causality? Is it that maybe this is coming from uh, people expecting there to be some sort of federal support or anything like that? It's part of the reason why we wanted to look at places with high and low levels of racial resentment, because based on that survey evidence, it would suggest that it was really places with higher levels of racial resentment that saw a decrease in their racial animus during these election cycles. And what we find is evidence pretty consistent with that. Um, but we don't think of that as sort of like the uh, smoking gun. We think of it as one piece of a whole body of evidence that taste is important. And then lastly, the point about trying to dig into the mechanism. So we have looked a little bit at some of the non-linearities non and what's kind of, um, I don't know what the right word for it is, either damning or shocking or sad, pick a word, is that even at relatively low levels of a black population, you still observe that there is this difference in pricing. So it's not the case that where our, where our mind wants to jump sometimes is like, oh, this it must be that we're thinking of like a Cleveland or like a Detroit, but even at places that have relatively small percentages of black residents, you start to see these differences kind of emerge. But we, we definitely uh, receive your, your comments and your notes. And if you're okay to send me your slides outside of this, we would, we would love to have them. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Carol, I, we have some extended offer, slides for you. <laughs> I think the slides are on our website. Carol, there was one question from the audience I wanted to share. Matthew, the question was, how do you measure the cost of the bonds? In the example you gave, you were using the coupon, but of course, a lot of bonds are not sold at par. So how are you measuring the cost of the, bar, of the bonds? Yeah, so that example was uh, just an example. We're doing the total annualized cost. So we include both your yield and your gross spread because we want to basically 
kind of get exactly what we're saying, but the fact that it's it's not really so much the coupon. Um, but that's what we're doing in the paper is the annualized total cost. So it includes the growth spread and it includes the yield to maturity. David, are there any other questions? Because if not, I have. Can I, am I allowed to ask a question? You're, you're encouraged to do so. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm kind of more of an institutionalist, I guess, than uh, you are, Matthew or Casey was. So my reaction to some of this from my life experience is, uh, for example, looking at the state of Michigan, did you guys think of looking at some institutional issues like whether the state, whether the envi political environment has um, uh, it takes over or it, it does um, emergency managers for, because if you look at the state of Michigan, all the emergency managers have basically been in black, solidly black communities. Um, or on the other hand, did you look at whether states give their own backing and, and financial support and they have something like the Michigan um, Financial Authority, which will borrow on the behalf or which will wrap its credit around the uh, local authority? 100%. So we kind of looked at that in two ways. We didn't, first, we didn't, we didn't have the, uh, the, the good idea to directly look at the race of the person who is tasked with intervening. That's a very cool idea. What we looked at was based on what's been done in the literature, which is looking at whether or not the state has um, like proactive uh, default, if the state is able to step in on behalf of the municipality. And what we show is that in states where the state is able to step in on behalf of the municipality, you don't observe a significant difference in pricing. It's really in states in which the default falls on the municipality, which is kind of consistent with what you would expect. You would expect that if there's not really a default or credit risk that falls on the municipality, then this characteristic that we're showing really the market doesn't seem to um, pay a, a penalty on. So we do show that. We we're also concerned about the political structure. And that was part of the reason why we wanted to look at places that elect both Democrats and also Republicans, because there's so many stories of reverse causality based on if you think that this is because Black residents are likely to be in areas that are going to receive larger public surplus or places that are going to be um, more progressive or whatever. There's so many different reverse causality stories. So that's why we wanted to use the level of Black population in 1980. And that's also why we wanted to look at places that elect Democrats and Republicans to show that this is kind of pervasive. Lastly, in the paper, we do regional analysis. We show that this is true all across different regions of the US and we do year by year analysis. And we show that you find this pricing penalty in virtually every year of our sample from 1990 to 2019. Um, so we did think about those institutional and what about And what about past history? Yes. What about us, uh, you know, places where they really had run up, they were against the wall and now they've, they've gotten better. And do you see any differences there? So we didn't, we didn't, we didn't think to look in, in terms of that, in terms of like the credit history of the place. Does it matter if you're in a place that has had traditionally really poor credit history or really bad uh, credit experiences? That's something we can, we can certainly look at. Because I think you shouldn't, you shouldn't assume that the, the rating they get reflects all that because you're not you're also in the position where you're, you're not assuming that the, the credit rating has absorbed all that anyway everything else otherwise you're trying to control for everything else anyhow and that maybe that's one of those other uh, performance indicators that you should be trying to control for. no that's a, that's certainly a cool idea we one of the things that we've thought about looking at are places that have had um like previous episodes of uh, previous episodes of racial resentment or previous episodes of like um, of some sort of racial crisis. We, we weren't even thinking about also looking at. Uh, like, yeah, that's that's a super cool idea. We can definitely look at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do, anything else, David? No, no other questions, issues? I think this was great. I, 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 I think you, you guys have uh, a lot in front of you, right? <laughs> A, a, a lot more. I really appreciate it. I knew nothing of this uh, background literature either. So thank you very much for the contribution. And we can move on now, I think. Um, am I, if I'm a little ahead of schedule, I suppose that's okay. To the second paper um, in this um, 
session on uh, the S, S in um, ESG. The second paper is um, Native American government's co borrowing costs, evidence again from the municipal bond markets. Uh, there are three authors, Serena Loftus from Kent State University, Zhang from Kent State University, RZ Zhang from uh, Kent State University, and Sarah Shanka McCoy, uh, who's at the University of New Mexico. All of these authors are, I believe, um, um, accounting academics, and their training is in accounting, which is also very interesting. Um, and Sarah uh, McCoy is going to be the presenter, and she will be followed by uh, a very interesting discussant, Lacey Horn who is the founder and CEO of Native uh, Advisory, which is a fiscal consulting firm that works with Native American tribes. So we've got, uh, uh, we've changed our environment here and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Sarah and you've got your 15 minutes to present your paper. Look forward to it. Great, thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to just jump right into our paper on Native American government's borrowing cost um, evidence from the municipal bond market. Uh, the United States government recognizes 574 tribal governments as sovereign nations. These are independent governments located within the geography of the United States. Tribal governments collectively control 100 million acres of land and represent nearly 10 million citizens. They're responsible for carrying out many of the same functions as state and local governments, like law enforcement, judicial systems, healthcare, infrastructure development and maintenance. And at the same time, they also have to develop their local economies for their citizens. However, tribal governments report unmet capital needs, <clears throat> tallying $44 billion annually, which impacts their ability to provide services um, and infrastructure for their citizens. Um, I have a quote here on the slides from Dante Desiderio, who uses the analogy, what water is to farming, capital is to economic to development. And to quote, um, Indian country has been starved by not receiving the capital it needs, the water it needs, and it is reflected in the policies, end quote. This view of this lack of access to capital is echoed by many tribal leaders and advocates. Um, this lack of access to capital has real consequences for tribes. Um, for example, one third of the residents of the Navajo Nation here in New Mexico lack running water. Native Americans are less likely to have access to plumbing and electricity. There are also implications for healthcare quality and access for Native Americans. So how do governments get capital? How do they get money? Typically, state and local governments can use tax revenue, an, av an avenue that's pretty limited for tribal governments. Um, they can also access capital through borrowings, particularly through the municipal market. Tribal governments can also raise money through the municipal market. The Internal Revenue Code establishes that tribal governments should be treated as states, which allows them to issue tax-exempt debt. However, the IRC um, places additional restrictions on tribes that are not present for states in their issuance of tax-exempt debt. First, the IRC only allows tribes to issue tax-exempt debt for essential government functions, where essential government functions is not a very clearly defined term, but it does not include functions, quote, not customarily performed by state and local governments, end quote. Uh, in addition, the IRC restricts um, tribes from issuing private activity bonds, many of which are tax-exempt bonds for qualified projects, including airports and hospitals. Tribal leaders specifically call out this lack of tax parity and that it limits their ability to obtain tax-exempt financing for many capital projects. Many articles have discussed the limited access tribes have to municipal capital. A research working paper from 2013 documents that only 17% of tribes have issued municipal debt. An article from Matthew Gregg from the Bookings Institution documents a 559-fold difference in issuances between state and tribal governments and municipal issuances. In addition, articles have found that um, there are higher IRS audit rates for tribal municipal bonds, specifically for their tax exempt debt. They're 30 times more likely to be audited than a state and local government's tax exempt debt. 
in our sample, which I'll get to um, shortly to discuss more about our, our sample, um, we find that tribal issuances account for 0.01% of all municipal debt issuances, um, which is significantly less than the 3% of the population that American Indian and Alaska Native individuals make up. In addition, we find that tribal issuers are less likely to issue tax exempt debt relative to state and local issuers. In our sample, we find that 73% of tribal issuances are uh, tax exempt versus 93% for state and local governments. Thus, we, we see the regulatory obstacles to issuing tax exempt debt, specifically those embedded in the Internal Revenue Code. And we also are seeing these repercussions of these restrictions in the form of underuse of municipal capital by Native American governments. <clears throat> There have been many attempts to remove the restrictions, these restrictions to capital, and broaden Native American government's access to tax-exempt capital. A temporary program was introduced in 2009, the Tribal Economic Development Bonds Program, which provided a $2 billion cap in total to all 574 federally recognized tribes. This allowed tribes to issue tax-exempt debt for many of the same projects that state and local governments are able to. Um, these funds have been mostly exhausted. Many legislative acts have been introduced that would remove the restrictions in the Internal Revenue Code, among other things, but none have successfully passed. The most recent attempts were in 2021 with the Tribal Tax and Investment Reform Act of 2021 and the Build Back Better Act of 2021. This was one of the provisions in that act, but neither were, were passed. <clears throat> there is still some debate about whether the Build Back Better Act would be brought back, but it seems unlikely. And there've also been many legislative hearings and reports many of which have recommended removing these restrictions in the Internal Revenue Code, but none, nothing has been done. Um, we hope that our paper and our findings can contribute to the current policy discussions surrounding tribal access to capital. So in our paper, what we're going to look at are those tribes that have overcome these regulatory obstacles and are able to successfully issue municipal debt. And we examine whether Native American governments face higher borrowing costs for their municipal bonds than state and local governments do. <clears throat> to address this research question, we first identify a sample of Native American municipal bond issuances by searching the Mergent Municipal Bond Securities database for a number of tribe name keywords and their derivatives. Um, this results in a sample of 362 bonds issued by 56 tribal nations from 1992 to 2021. If you look in our paper at the time series graph, you can see tribal issuances peaked in the 2000s. Um, total issuances we're capturing are about $4.9 billion um, of taxable and tax exempt municipal debt. Our variable of interest in our empirical test is the initial bond yield. So we require all observations, all bonds to have that initial bond yield, which reduces our sample side to 277 bonds issued by 42 tribal nations. This is a small sample. Most of you, most of the academics here are probably thinking this is a pretty small sample, um, but this is, this is the reality we're faced in working in this space. <clears throat> um, Next, we have to um, identify a sample of state and local governments. We try to make this comparable to our tribal sample by selecting those issuances from state and local governments that are in the same state and year as tribal government issuances, as well as that have similar features of, as tribal government issuances. Um, and requiring non-missing yields results in about a sample a little under a million bond observations for state and local governments. Um, I would like to caveat this by saying that although Native American governments and state and local governments face a similar political and economic climate being located in the United States, they are inherently different entities. Since the IRC says Native American tribes should be treated as states, we think this is an appropriate and um, uh, useful comparison to make, but we do acknowledge that these are inherently different entities. <clears throat> This table presents our descriptive statistics, and this is probably the smallest text you're going to see on, um, on my slides. I'll blow up the font size in a minute, but I wanted you to see the differences between tribal and non-tribal governments on various bond characteristics. So here we have the bond characteristics. Here we have tribal governments, non-tribal governments, and the difference. So uh, for example, you can see the average yield for a tribal bond is 577 basis points. 
Uh, for state and local governments, their average yield measured in basis points is 288 basis points. The difference is 289. So thus, in this simple comparison using sample averages, tribes borrowing costs are double that of what state and local governments are. But um, however, you can see in the last set of columns, a lot of stars, which mean there are a lot of differences between tribal governments bond issuances and non-tribal governments, state and local governments bond issuances. And um, you can see many of the characteristics of bonds for tribes are characteristics that we'd associate with a higher yield or higher interest rate. For example, tribes are much less likely to have a financial advisor, 13% versus 70% for state and local governments. They are less likely to be rated. 73% of tribes are unrated versus 40% for state and local governments. When they are rated, they have poorer credit ratings. A higher rating, how we coded the variable, means it's poor, poor credit quality. So they have poorer credit ratings. In addition, they are more likely to issue taxable municipal debt than state and local governments. So all of these would indicate tribal issuances just because of the characteristics of the bond um, should have higher yields, which necessitates us to move to a specification that controls for all of these differences in the bond characteristics and the creditworthiness of the borrower. <clears throat> So our basic empirical specification, we regress the initial bond yield measured in basis points on an indicator for tribe. Um, along with control variables and various uh, fixed effects, we're also double, double clustering by issuer and issuance year month. Um, the hypothesis, our prediction is that beta one, the coefficient on the tribe indicator will be positive, meaning that um, after controlling for the bond characteristics, creditworthiness, um, tribes, relative to state and local governments pay higher yields. <clears throat> Our mean results are here presented. This is an excerpt from table three. You can see in column one, this just echoes the univariate evidence I presented in the um, couple slides ago uh, that tribes have double the borrowing costs. But when we add in control variables, state by year and rating fixed effects, this drops to 154 basis points. So that's the premium tribes are paying when they issue their municipal debt relative to state and local governments. Given that what the average non-tribal yield is, um, tribes pay about 53% higher interest than non-tribal governments. Um, given the average tribal loan amount, this is resulting in about $190,000 more in annual interest for the average tribal issuer over the average 10-year loan term. <clears throat> We move on to subsample analyses. Given there are so many differences between tribes and state and local governments, we try to focus on a more uniform sample. So in column one here, let's focus on that. This is a subsample of just rated bonds, which restricts us to a quarter of our tribal bond issuance sample. Um, and here we still find there is a premium tribes have to pay when, when um, issuing their municipal debt. They're paying a premium of 64 basis points relative to state and local governments, which is 22% higher than state and local governments, which would be about 79,000 more in annual interest um, costs for these tribal governments. We also restrict our subsamples to tax exempt bonds, insured bonds, um, non callable bonds, large, large loan amounts, and fixed rate bonds. And the tenor of our results um, does not change across any of these specifications. Um, for empirical robustness, we do several um, several things. Um, we do a couple matching techniques. First, a propensity score match with replacement and nearest neighbor propensity score match without replacement. We do entropy balancing. We do alternative fixed effect specifications. Um, and we're also doing more with the credit rating. So um, in lieu of just controlling for the credit rating, the continuous variable, and also controlling just for the credit rating fixed effects, we're including an indicator for rated to capture the unrated versus rated effect, as well as an interaction between rated and rating in the model. Um, in addition to this, on a related project, we've obtained all of the official statements and continuing disclosures for tribes that are subject to that SEC rule. And um, we are currently combing through those disclosures on a different project. Um, but one thing we're doing is we're making sure that the credit rating we have, given that 25% of tribes, only 25% are rated, we're making sure that Mergent accurately captured the credit rating that was listed in the official statement for tribes. So the results on that will be um, forthcoming. <clears throat> but we don't expect that to change the results of our paper much, if at all. 
So to conclude, Native American tribal governments pay a premium of somewhere between 64 to 251 basis points on their municipal debt. If you're going to quote me, quote me on 64 because I'm an accountant and I like to be conservative. Um, given that the average tribal municipal yield is 577 basis points and non-tribal is 288, this premium results in somewhere between a 22 to 87 percent higher cost of borrowing for tribal bonds. So these results highlight that tribal governments' challenges and accessing municipal bond capital do, capital do not end when they are able to access municipal markets. Rather, tribal governments experience significantly higher borrowing costs than state and local governments that may affect the benefits of their, of their borrowing. So we hope to contribute by informing policymakers' understanding of the borrowing landscape for tribal governments. And we also hope that our research can provide a foundation for future research to explore additional factors that may influence tribal governments' borrowing costs. Um, so next, I just want to thank thank um, the conference organizers for this opportunity. It's rare that I get to work with people that are in the on the ground working in practice, and it's been a real excellent opportunity to work with Lacey Horn, um, and we really look forward to her comments. So uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you, thank you, Sarah, and you just sort of did my job. So I'm going to turn it <laughs> I'm going to turn it over um, to Lacey Horn. Um, for her comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osio Nagata. Hello, everyone. My name is Lacey Horn, and I'm the CEO of Native Advisory Strategic and Financial Advisory Services Firm serving Native American tribes. And I feel it's important just to give a little bit more background on me and my experience so that you can have a foundation for the comments that I'm about to make about this paper and give context on what the tribes are facing. So from our perspective, uh, what this actually translates to. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and I live in the Cherokee Nation in Eastern Oklahoma. And I'm a CPA with big four experience in financial services audit. And during my time at KPMG, I was able to view numerous corporate bond structures as well as work with several banks, asset managers and other financial services firms that were involved with municipal debt. I also served eight years as the treasurer of the Cherokee Nation, overseeing all financial functions of the Cherokee Nation tribal government. During my time as treasurer at Cherokee, I had the opportunity to be a part of several different types of debt issuances by the tribe and its entities, including bonds, lines of credit, and syndicated loans, with most of these qualifying as tax exempt debt. So I draw on these previous experiences, as well as my current experiences working with numerous tribes across the country and becoming aware of the taxable and tax exempt debt structures that they already have or that they're in the process of securing. So hopefully that gives a bit of color as to who I am. So I also want to thank Brookings and the authors for the invitation to speak today, as well as the work and efforts that have gone into this paper and this conference. Because Native American stories aren't ones that are usually even told, or if they are told, they aren't told very well. And the authors have done a great job with this in bringing visibility to a very real issue that the tribes are facing. Next, I want to validate the issues raised in this paper. In my experience, the issues the authors raise are very accurate. And I had always suspected that there were differences in the way tribes borrowed versus other governments, but there was never any evidence to back up my suspicions. And now we have it. And so I, I just want to share my screen here and show uh, my slide. I just have the one, um, but it's an excerpt of the paper. Let me hit the button here and go full screen. And yeah, so there we have it. It's in black and white. We're paying 100% more than state and local governments. And that's equating to $190,000 to $310,000 in annual additional interest payments. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So stopping the share and going back to uh, my comments on this, you know, why? You know, 100%, that's, you know, double. Uh, why would we be assessed these higher borrowing costs? And is this, is this our risk premium? Is this the misunderstanding of Indian country as a whole? Or is this something else entirely? Because the costs to us are very real. And so let's first address some risk perspectives and just give a little bit of color on Indian country in general. So tribes have been in this country since time immemorial. 
And like other governments, we will never move. You know, if there's a, it's like cor- looking at corporations, you know, if there's a better tax code in Mexico, we're not going to pick up and leave. And I remember recently in the news, there was talk that Disney World was, was looking to leave Orlando. And as someone who's been there countless times, you know, you know that that's wholly impossible to do. And that's the same with tribes. We aren't going anywhere. We are here and we're very place-based people. And that's why we're borrowing is to make our lives and our tribes better for all who live in and around us. We have a permanency of existence in this country and we were here long before the federal government existed and will be here long after. But here we are uh, being treated like Johnny come lately risky bets, paying a premium for what I believe is um, just a continuation of longstanding histories of exploitation of tribes as well as just this overall general lack of understanding. And my observations are rooted in history. Tribes have been taken advantage of time and again. We've had our investments stolen. And now we're seeing uh, there in in an academic paper how our borrowing costs are documented to be unbelievably high. Um, As was stated earlier, uh, there are limitations on the types of projects we can even pursue with tax exempt debt. And then when we do borrow, uh, we're asked for extreme over securitization and over collateralization uh, that's pretty much demanded of us. So there's barriers and risks for tribes everywhere. And these keep us in a cycle of financial traumas. And so the biases in the municipal market drive us to taxable debt. You know, as, 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 as Sarah has reported, you know, we're not, we're not showing up very much in the tax exempt uh, bond markets very often anymore. And, it's, and as she said, there was a peak in the 2000s. Uh, so so we're, we're going in a few different directions now. So we're going towards taxable debt or we're not borrowing at all, or even worse, we're looking towards more alternative and riskier types of credit that further destroy our faith in debt obligations as a whole and cause debt to become a very political issue for our leadership. I should mention here that of the 574 federally recognized tribes, we are all very different from each other. And there are very little apples to apples comparison. And just because uh, you've worked with one tribe or two doesn't mean that that you're an expert on on the third, fourth, and fifth tribe that you work with. And then a a common theme that I hear is in doing business with, with tribes is that it's risky to do tribes because you can't do them due to tribal sovereign immunity. And I can assure you that in all of these, um, all of these debt obligations that we're going into, uh, we are asked to, and we do grant limited waivers of tribal sovereign immunity in the event of a dispute. So the issue of being, you know, quote, unable to sue the tribe doesn't exist. And so that's not a reason to embed a risk premium. And so as we look at this data though, we can see the systemic overarching problem that any one tribe would face at the outset of seeking capital. And again, I think this is based on a lack of understanding, which is totally fair. Because as I said at the beginning, our stories rarely get told and when they do get told, they don't get told with much accuracy. I see banks that have worked for tribes for years still showing that lack of understanding. Members of Congress wholly unclear on tribes, despite us having that direct government to government relationship with the federal government. We're not accurately portrayed in movies, not taught in classrooms. And we know that our demographic data sets are lacking and misrepresentative. So it makes perfect sense that this lack of understanding, this distrust for us, uh, mystification of us is one of the major contributing factors to the premium that we face in the capital markets, in my opinion. And so now that I've given some perspective on some of the frustrations and the challenges that we face in the borrowing process, uh, let's talk about the importance of capital to to tribes and what that increased premium actually translates to in real dollars and services. And as I've said before, tribes are borrowing for projects to enhance the quality of life for our people. We're borrowing for healthcare centers, infrastructure projects, and other necessary governmental functions to move our tribes forward. And these aren't usually speculative bets as our hands are tied by the regulatory essential government function test. And so that limits the the types of projects that we can even pursue. 
And so what does that $190,000 to $310,000 annually translate? And, and over you know, 10 and a half years, the average bond term, you know, $2 million to $3.3 million, you know, what can that do? So it can save a Native woman with higher rates of violence against Native women than any other race. A few hundred thousand dollars a year could go towards salaries and supportive services for Native women and girls in danger. It can save Native languages with indigenous languages in the United States being at critical risk for extinction, extinction. A few hundred thousand dollars a year could go towards salaries and digitization of native languages to preserve them for future generations. And finally, a few hundred thousand dollars can go towards education, providing college scholarships for native youth to pursue financial careers to help overcome the barriers we're facing in the traditional capital markets. Which leads into my recommendation to all the stakeholders, service providers and institutions in the entirety of the municipal bond sector, which is to hire natives of these federally recognized tribes to be on your team so that when you're at the table, you have a better chance of finding understanding so that the tribe doesn't have to pay the 100% risk premium. So in summary, tribal credit worthiness is inherent. We have a permanency of existence and a long-term outlook. Sometimes we are the square peg trying to fit into a round hole with our data and our due diligence, but I promise you the information exists to support our ability to be good partners in financing. If we can solve this issue, then tribes will be able to borrow at rates at fair rates alongside their non-tribal government peers and the capital that is so severely needed in Indian country will be able to flow to us. As the paper states, that's an estimated $44 billion annually. So this is an incredible opportunity to, to serve. It's a need to be met. And you know, we talk about the S and ESG, this is it. So I leave you all with this challenge. Let's start with the extremely high borrowing costs, but not stop there. Let's revolutionize the system to bring much needed capital to tribes and restore faith on all sides. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank, thank you, Lacey. And I would like to give Sarah or any of her co-authors the opportunity to uh, respond to the issue you raised, the several issues you've raised, in particular, um, the way in which um, they hope their work can contribute to what you are trying to do. So Sarah, back to you. Yeah, thank you. And we've spoken with Lacey before, and this it's just really um, helpful for us to hear from tribal members about how this is impacting them. Um, we hope that our paper maybe comes out that this is just one tiny piece of evidence in a stream of evidence, just supporting sort of the idea that there is this, this issue with their access to capital um, and even just removing those regulatory obstacles, which I think many people have been lobbying for, many organizations have lobbied for. That's just, you know, the first step. There will be more hurdles in terms of increasing access to capital. But um, yeah, no, we really appreciate Lacey's comments. This has been a, a, an amazing opportunity to work with her. <clears throat> Can I ask, uh, in, 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 in putting this together, uh, this project together, did you find it hard to just come up with the basic facts uh, on the on the ground for um, for credit, both for credit worthiness and for credit um, access now? And is there a, might there be a, a a thing that you guys could do to expand this into a sort of like presenting the basic facts? I'm I'm looking at what you wanted in your in your last slide to be the contribution of, of this moving forward, and I'm thinking that there are things that you've done here in an academic way that could be done in a much more general way to help educate the people that you and, as Lacey was pointing out, needed a better education on this? Well, I think um, what we are looking at, we are working on other projects in this area, looking at sort of that cross-sectional variation in tribal borrowing to come up with more um, uh, understanding of why they are charged as premium. Like Lacey said, there is there may be this general misunderstanding, this risk premium, premium assigned to tribes um, because of just misunderstanding of what Native American tribes are and what they represent. Um, so we're doing more in that. We're sort of, in terms of the data available as empiricists, there's a real lack of data in this space. We are drowning in FOIA requests trying to get more data on tribes. And it's um that's the most challenging part of working in this area is not having good data on tribes. You can get census data, but that doesn't really represent a lot of 
kind of understanding what these tribes represent. Yeah, so. Because my, my first reaction, of course, was, okay, if you've got a borrowing issue here um, from the lender's point of view, how does this get paid back, right? What, what, are, what are your revenue sources here and how deep are they? I should mention in our sample, the vast majority of our tribes are casino operators. So that's- That, that was going to be my next yeah. question. They, 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 there's limited tax, right? There's a limited tax base. They can't do property tax. Most of their lands held in trust by the federal government. They have limited tax bases. Um, so they have to get there. They have to pay it back with revenue sources from their business ventures, which to develop those business ventures, you need capital. But um, most all of our tribes are casino operators. I believe there's one that has extensive smoke shops that is a source of significant revenue, but most are casino operators. Lacey, would you agree with that? Or, I know you don't know the ins and outs yeah. totally of all of our tribes in our sample, but. <clears throat> yeah, so tribes on the whole are, because of what Sarah just raised is we don't have a tax base from which to tax fund. We have to create our own revenue sources and that is typically through economic development ventures. So, you know, the, the biggest one being casino gaming. Uh, there's also lots of work being done in federal contracting, as well as other smaller sources of revenue that tribes have looked at from food production to um, convenience stores. You know, it really spans the gamut, but tribes are looking to monetize and create revenue economically in any way that they can. Great. And I had another question, and it also is mirrored by somebody who sent a question on the Q&A, which is, okay, that's the, that's the supply side. You guys are, 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 are trying to use uh, back your, your, your bonds with casino revenue. Who's buying? Who, who, who are the holders of, of uh, this paper? And that's not just my question, but also a question from somebody who wrote it into me. We have not looked at holdings data. I do know that most of our tribal bonds, uh, it's probably 40, 40%, 40% are negotiated offerings and 40% are private placements. So um, they may not be widely held. And also in our, as we've been obtaining the um, official statements and continuing disclosures, a lot of these bonds are going to be closely held and not subject to certain SEC rules. So it's a very- you don't, know if those are bad, you don't know if those are financial institutions or individuals. We don't have that data right now. No, we don't. We don't. We Is that gettable? That's, those data are gettable? So right. I know that whenever we went to call a 2006 series of bonds that we asked that question of our trustee who are our bondholders and they were not able and would not reveal who they were. Um, and, but we did know that it was all private placement of our bonds. And so we, we did not know if those were individual investors, institutional, uh, we were not given that insight. And I, I would just um, like to chime in to add that many people in the audience may not be aware of the complexity of lawmaking um, surrounding these entities. So, for instance, when you talk about tax revenue, you're thinking perhaps about a state setting or a federal setting, but these entities are operating in an intersection of um, tribal authority disputes over state rights to tax revenue and, and federal issues. And so we've, as we jump into this kind of subsample analysis, it's been an area that has required us to really, you know, in a set, in essence, treat this more as, as a field project in understanding the individual tribe and the jurisdictions and complexities that apply to each entity, as opposed to um, making the types of kind of more generalizable statements that we often see in finance and accounting research. And so I know that that can be frustrating, but it's important for us because of the variation in these nations. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um... You're, you're digging out of it. You have to dig at a very micro level here, right? G gross aggregates are not going to cut it. Um, are there any, David, are there any questions coming in? No, from the not, um, Dan Bergstresser notes that 
if insurance companies hold these or mutual funds, that would have to be publicly disclosed. That could be painstaking because they don't exactly have a code for Native American tribe, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and I was curious about the same thing, whether the, you either Lacey or the authors have had any conversations with mu mutual with the mutual fund to buy taxable and non-taxable uh, muni get, whether they're even willing to play in this area or they just look at it as too, too small a market for them. No, we, we haven't just met with any mutual, but mostly we've met with people who are on the issuing side, those who are involved with issuing or helping tribes through this process. So, but we haven't looked at the demand side, but I think that's a really interesting insight and it would be cumbersome. I know we have the mutual fund um, holdings data, but we have, there, there aren't a ton of observations in our sample. So that's <laughs> one good thing of having a small sample is we only have a certain, might be, it might not be too cumbersome. Well, I'm hoping that, by um, sharing this work and by the conversation we've had here that there are a lot of municipal bond market participants on the conference. And I would encourage anybody who has insight into this or particularly anybody who has any idea about where the institutional demand is to reach out to the authors. And if you need help, we can happily broker the conversation, but that's one of the goals of the conference. And so we would yeah, we'd greatly appreciate any insight and any conversations. Thank you. I, 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 I thank you. You've done a, a, a really uh, heroic job here of getting this in front of people who have probably never thought about it. And so I think it, 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 it's, it's uh, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure there will be much follow on from this. I, I intend to write you a few things and I suspect David and some of the people on the advisory committee here may do the same. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Powerful women Thank here. Thank you, Lacey. Okay, we are breaking now and we are scheduled to come back uh, for uh, measuring uh, climate adoption at 1230. So we're on break till 1230.
Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Lehman. I'm a director with S&P Global Ratings, and I'll be moderating the next two presentations. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Brookings for putting on such a great conference, and thank you all for attending. As a reminder to our audience, viewers can submit questions by visiting the website sli.do and entering the code MUNIFINANCE, one word. In this session, we'll discuss two papers relating measures of climate risk, adaptation, and other ESG factors with municipal bond characteristics, including pricing, which is an area of growing interest academically and within the industry. The first paper we will discuss is entitled Measuring Cities Climate Adaptation and is authored by Anya Nakmarina and Shirley Liu. Dr. Nakmarina will be the presenting author and our discussant will be Alexa Gordon. Dr. Nakmarina is an assistant professor of accounting at the Yale School of Management the research interests revolve around financial reporting, governance, and monitoring. The current work explores these topics in the context of municipal markets, as well as by focusing on institutional investors and shareholder activism. Dr. Nakmarina earned her PhD from the University of Chicago. Additionally, she holds an MBA from the University of Chicago. Outside of academia, she worked in venture capital and equity research. Alexa joined Goldman Sachs in January 2013 and is a portfolio manager within Goldman Sachs Asset Management's Municipal Fixed Income Team, where she is responsible for portfolio construction and implementation for municipal separate accounts. In addition, Alexa leads the team's ESG strategy. For joining Goldman Sachs, Alexa worked at Wells Fargo, most recently on the Muni Institutional Sales and Trading Desk. She's a member of the Municipal Bond Club, the Women's Bond Club of New York, Alexa has a BA in economics from UCLA and an MBA from NYU. With that, please take it away, Dr. Nakarina. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction, Renzi. Um, I want to start out by thanking the organizers for inviting the paper to the conference. Can you guys see my slides? Okay. Um, yeah, we're really grateful to be a part of this uh, fantastic event, and we're looking forward to the feedback uh, from uh, academics, market participants, and especially, um, I'm very excited about the comments uh, by Alexa. Thank you, Alexa, for sending some of the comments in advance. Uh, and this work, we're trying to understand uh, how to measure uh, cities' climate adaptation and uh, what are the determinants of cities adaptation. And we're motivated by the fact that um, this is important. A lot of high level bodies recognize that cities are at the front line of climate risk. Uh, they face a lot of climate related risks that tend to be compounded and they don't really have a choice but to adapt. They're going to be at the front line of Brazilian development. Uh, it seems that there is a recognition that climate adaptation is a worthwhile thing to do, but we actually don't, don't know that much empirically uh, which cities are adapting and why. So this is our objective function in this paper is to measure and to understand why some of the cities are more prepared uh, to the looming climate change than others. A key challenge in this project and really any other project that could be focused on the uh, ad actual adaptation it's because we don't really have a lot of empirical data on what cities do. Cities themselves know what they do and um, they usually have some summer statistics uh, somewhere, but there's no and uh, the determinants of adaptation or consequences of it uh, more precisely. So we're trying to address this challenge in this paper by introducing the measure of cities' climate adaptation. Our measure is going to be based on the comprehensive analysis, uh, textual analysis of uh, a set of cities' financial disclosures over time and we're going to go out in the field and collect all types of disclosures. And we're going to zoom into the main determinants of adaptation. And the core finding in this paper, just to preview the results at the top for you, is that uh, a variation in adaptation is going to be explained by four major things. It's going to be explained by the flood risk, by the political ideology and beliefs about climate change, by capital constraints and by the outlook of the planning horizons. 
I want to be very clear that in this paper, we are focusing specifically on one aspect of climate risk, specifically on uh, flood risk. And this is a conscious choice that we make. Uh, we look at the flood risk for three major reasons. First, we know that elevated flood risks is a consequence of climate change. Uh, there's enough evidence in the literature, including on meteorology and climate science, that flood risk is the consequence of climate change. Warmer planet temperatures uh, contribute to heavier precipitation, to increases in number of hurricanes, and to rise in the sea levels. And that has been more or less established. Second reason why we look at the flood risk is because flood-related events tend to dominate uh, other events, both in terms of numbers and the US dollar damage costs. So this risk is very salient and it's very current to, to the state of cities uh, nowadays. Uh, the third reason why we're looking at the flood risk is because um, as a humanity, we kind of know what to do about flood risk and how to address it. So there's a specific set of solutions, which is not perfect, but it is specific, which is going to be uh, the easiest for us to capture the textual analysis. And our main contribution is this paper and the main innovation is to do this textual analysis on the set of financial disclosures of the cities. And more specifically, we try to be very comprehensive and capture basically all the financial disclosures that seems important in measuring this uh, flood risk and adaptation to the flood risk. We're looking at uh, comprehensive annual financial reports because they reflect the current adaptation projects that the cities might have. We're looking at budgets because budgets are going to contain information about forward looking uh, adaptation plans, what a city is going to do in the future. And we're looking at bond prospectuses because any funding for adaptation projects, which tend to be capital intensive projects, are most likely to be raised from bond prospectuses. We're going to collect this data from Emma and a lot of times budgets and bond and uh, coffers are not available on Emma. So we're going to look at city websites and reach out to cities to obtain a panel of 356 cities that are going to be located in 41 states in MDC over the period between 2013 and 2019. And we're trying to capture all the cities that could be considered major. So we're going to be focusing on, on the cities that have population exceeding 150,000 people and for cities for the cities that are located on the coast we are capturing all the cities that exceed the population of 40,000 people. Uh, once we have collected this data we're going to apply our methodology on this data and our methodology is rooted in defining adaptation in the following way we're going to uh, define adaptation as a set of two categories, either hard adaptation or soft adaptation. Uh, those categories are rooted in our reading of the climate science literature. The uh, climate science says that uh, there's a hard adaptation or infrastructure project that could be undertaken to reduce flood risk. So this could be seawalls, dikes, flood walls. So if the city in, has a seawall, or make some improvements in the sea wall, we're going to be able to extract this information using our textual analysis. The second big measure that we're using in this paper is soft adaptation. Uh, there's a huge body of literature that says that oftentimes soft adaptation or investment in nature and sediment-based solutions uh, could help reduce flood risks, specifically for the cities that are located on the coast um, could be cheaper, uh, better for the environment, and better overall in certain situations. So we're also interested in trying to extract this information from the city's annual reports. So once we have defined our adaptation measures, uh, we're going to build a dictionary, an adaptation dictionary uh, that is going to help us uh, actually create uh, those measures empirically. Uh, in order to build our dictionary, we're going to search the related literature, we're going to search uh, various industry reports um, for the initial set of um, list of keywords that are related 
to adaptation projects. And we're going to validate this set of keywords and augment it manually by reading the, the financial disclosures of the cities of 16 cities from three states over time. And we'll try to make sure that some we're not missing anything important. In the end, uh, we are going to be left with uh, 93 hard adaptation keywords, 31 soft adaptation keywords, and 20 general adaptation keywords. And we're going to use this dictionary in order to construct our measures. Uh, this is how our measures look over time. Uh, they seem to be increasing uh, with time uh, across the board. Uh, we don't see much variation in annual reports, but overall, it seems that the number of sentences in the respective uh, documents seem to be looking up, uh, just tells us that cities are adapting more and more to, to, to the looming flood risks. Uh, there's a relatively um, high correlation between the flood risk and adaptations. Uh, so we see that areas where flood risk is higher also tend to adapt more. And it gives us some comfort that maybe the measures that we have constructed actually captures the underlying, uh, pro uh, the underlying constructs. We then do two formal sets of analysis to uh, really validate our measures. We show that cities that have higher adaptation uh, also tend to have lower flood insurance premium rates. Um, that tells us that uh, market participants and the government are recognizing uh, the efforts that were made and that were actually by the cities in order to adapt and that we're actually capturing those uh, those analysis perfect uh, well. We also look at cities' uh, municipal bond spreads. Some of the prior papers, including I think some of the papers that were presented at this conference previously show that cities um, the flood risk is priced in muni bonds. We show that this flood risk premium is attenuated when we control for adaptation measures. So cities with higher adaptation fees reduce flood risk premium. That all makes sense to us and gives us some comfort that we actually uh, constructed good measures. Uh, now we'll move to a more interesting part of the study when we're actually looking at the determinants of climate adaptation. And the first thing that we do is we're basically examining the relationship between flood risk and adaptation. And on this map, uh, I'm showing you all the cities that we have uh, where the color, the brightness of the color red indicates the flood risk. So the redder the dot uh, or the bubble, the higher the flood risk. And the size of the bubble indicates uh, the extent of cities' adaptation efforts. So the higher, the bigger the bubble, the more uh, is done by the city in terms of adaptation. Just eyeballing this map, we can see that there is a correlation between flood risk and adaptation. We confirm this uh, association uh, using regression analysis, which shows that flood risk is highly associated with both uh, full adaptation measure that is a combination of hard, soft, and general, separately with hard adaptation and separately with uh, soft adaptation. And this is a very uh, rigorous analysis where we are controlling for a state and year fixed effects, as, as well as the, for the size of the city and the size of the documents from which we have extracted our measures. We also show that uh, this relationship intensifies following the exposure to $1 billion hurricanes. So once a hurricane hits the state, a uh, very massive and explosive hurricane that hits the state, that has become more aware that uh, flood risk is permanent to salient and they tend to adapt more, uh, which we think is interesting. Uh, in the final part of the paper, we are trying to control for the flood risk and examine what kinds of determinants are there, uh, what kinds of things are associated with a higher adaptation. And we're looking at three uh, sets of determinants. We're looking at partisanship, at capital constraints, and at the planning horizons. 
And what we find is that partisanship, uh, especially Republicans, uh, having Republican mayor is ne negatively correlated with adaptation measures. I want to say out front that we're not claiming any causality here, we're just observing the association. We observe that Republicans are negatively correlated with adaptation measures, but when we zoom into counties, into areas where citizens are more worried uh, about climate change, this relationship is significantly attenuated. So what we conclude from this uh, analysis is that there is a high association between uh, the beliefs of the citizenry and the extent of adaptation efforts as performed by the city. Next, we look at the capital constraints and we find that cities that have more funds in their hands, cities with higher unrestricted fund balances, are more likely to invest in adaptation. That makes sense to us because we believe that having more money uh, is going to be helpful in investing in those capital intensive projects that tend to take a long time and tend to uh, require a higher investment. Our final result is that planning horizon also seems to matter. And what we do is we hand collect capital budgets outlook or the number of years uh, for which city has reported their capital budget plans, uh, CIPs, it, it, it turns out that the longer this uh, planning outlook, uh, the higher the adaptation. So we interpret it as, you know, planning matters and thinking about this long-term risk, planning, having longer horizons could be instrumental in planning out for the, um, for, for the long-term risk, such as climate risk. This brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, just to sum the paper briefly for you, we introduced new measures for city level climate adaptation, and we're trying to take this first step in understanding the determinants of city level adaptation. Thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to Alexa's discussion. Thank you, Anya. And with that, I'll turn it over to our discussant, Alexa. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. I think that was really helpful, Anya. Um, I really liked hearing about uh, the presentation of the paper. Um, just to preface, I wanted to make sure that um, I note that these are my personal views that I'm sharing. They're not representative of Goldman Sachs, um, nor do any of my comments qualify as an investment advice um, or constitute anyone listening to this as clients of Goldman Sachs. So with that said, um, I would love to share my takeaways from the paper. So I think after reading the paper and hearing um, the comments just discussed, I, I had four main takeaways and reactions. Um, I think first was a real affirmation in terms of what we're doing on a day in day out basis. And you know, I think where that stems from is that one of the biggest challenges as an investor, which the authors really got to experience firsthand, is that there's no consistency in terms of the way that issuers talk or think about many topics, including climate change or any other topics for that matter. Um, and I think that's just the nature of our market. So the municipal market for those who aren't fully up to speed represents over 50,000 different issuers of all different shapes and sizes, each which operate in states that have their own unique set of laws or requirements on how and what to disclose. And so because of this, issuers also have very numerous ways that they can disseminate information. And that may be on websites or in budgets or in formal filings, in press releases or other. And as an investor, it's almost the biggest challenge just to capture, synthesize and analyze all of the different metrics that are gathered from multiple sources. So seeing the hundreds of cities that were examined as well as the 10,000s of documents, it was very validating. I think one of the reasons that this paper was especially topical and resonated so much with municipalities is that because there's a very long-term view in municipalities what I mean by that is that typically in the corporate space, um, a corporate entity could get up and move headquarters, whereas municipal cities cannot relocate. And so they must adapt or else they face some type of extinction. Um, and beyond this, their horizon is infinite. So much longer than the quarterly or annual cadence of a lot of corporate earnings calls. So to this point, my second takeaway was a huge appreciation for the innovation utilized in the paper. I think oftentimes we think of financial markets and decisions driven by numbers. 
Um, and I think this exercise where um, we were using words and semantics felt very different. The authors take this, took this approach to kind of qualify and quantify some of the risks and adaptation methods by using language processing and impressive back testing, which you all heard about in the previous presentation. And this really allowed for scale, which is really important given the myriad of issuers and documents that we just spoke about. I think I was also impressed by the utilization of industry accepted sources. And so a lot of that was related to science-based groups and leaders in our space, specifically um, the municipal space, such as CDP and IPCC. Um, and this really helped make the paper defensible from a scientific perspective, um, as well as kind of make it, have it make sense at a hypothetical level. I think the cons to that, which were noted in the paper is that it's very challenging to apply some of these um, scientific concepts down to specific boundaries in a consistent and comparable manner. And so I think they experienced some of those frustrations as well. But the machine learning and the systematic approach by building a dictionary was a great template that we could potentially use for other solutions down the line, um, whether it's social or invent, environmental uh, metrics that we are looking to extract from different documents. I wanted to make a quick note on the scope. And I know we talked about the scope a little bit, but um, I think the narrow focus was good for this exercise. I think this is the beginning papers and this is a starting point uh, to help validate a theory. I would note that in future papers, it would be really interesting and I would urge the authors to look beyond the flood risk and obviously understood why the flood risk was chosen, but there are many other acute physical risks, whether it's wildfire, water stress or droughts. And then thinking about some of the chronic risks like temperature rise or loss of biodiversity that could really be analyzed in future versions. I think also including additional cities would allow for a large and more representative sample size. Given in the US there are 19,000 cities, towns, and villages, I would love to see if the same conclusions hold true for additional cities, especially if you're looking equally at coastal and non-coastal cities. So, um, you know, I completely understand why the authors focused on the coastal cities given the current sample to maximize the power and, um, you know, there is an additional intent to focus on further cities in the future. But lastly, I think it would be really interesting to look at some more recent data. The paper spans until 2019, and I think a lot has been growing and changing on a week by week, month by month, and year by year basis. So it would be really interesting to examine some of the more recent results. But my third takeaway was around adaptation and what that actually means to and for investors. So in this paper, adaptation is actually defined as the number of sentences that contain adaptation keywords. I would say from an investor perspective, I think there's a real difference between disclosure or talking about a problem versus commitment to addressing the problems over the long-term with strategic goals and short-term realistic targets. So when it comes to municipalities, especially for material risks, what we want to know is that management, similar to other corporate entities, are committed to addressing these systemic issues with clear plans in place. And I think that goes a little bit beyond a word search and needs to be seen in tangible plans. Um, and so I think this does bring up a couple of salient points around city budgets and how far they should go, thinking about the long-term time horizons to properly reflect some of these long-term risks. But I do think that we want to see um, not only the risk involved, but also the mitigants in place. Um, and that's a big piece of just governance and one of the biggest drivers for financial decisions that we're making in our market day in, day out. Um, in the adaptation analysis component, I really did love reading about the determinants, which I thought was one of the really interesting pieces of the paper, especially why some cities might focus or invest um, more in adaptation. And so I think from my perspective, preparedness is key and understanding some of the headwinds or tailwinds is extremely important, uh, whether due to some of the political or even capital constraints involved. And you, know, you think about this at a practitioner's level and if a city can't even keep the lights on or pave their roads, how are they gonna start thinking about problems that might occur hundreds or thousands of years down the road? 
So the last topic uh, was pricing, and this was definitely my favorite section. Um, I would say that greeniums are a common topic of conversation in my world, uh, which is more referring to impact bonds and green labeled bonds and the intersection of sustainability and municipal finance. But this paper takes it one step further, <clears throat> excuse me, and actually talks about um, whether or not some of the material risks are incorporated into or appropriately priced into the um, yield of the bond, both from a primary and secondary trading perspective, um, with by by essentially comparing the yields of bonds to the corresponding matching treasuries. To that point, I think my only um, comment would be that in our market, the typical market convention is to compare um, these municipal bonds um, and their yields with municipal curves, whether it's AAA or other, rather than a treasury. And so what this paper doesn't necessarily take into account is the potential for the out or underperformance related to using two different asset classes. I would say that generally treasuries and munis trade in tandem, but there have absolutely been times of dislocation where that relationship is not correlated at all. So we would love to see this pricing piece done um, with a municipal curve as a benchmark. So that aside, I think, I think the takeaway was that um, cities with higher adaptation faced reduced climate risk premium in municipal bonds. And while I hope that's true, I think there may be somewhat of a muted effect. And this is also brought up, but I think there are high recoveries after floods or natural disasters from agencies like FEMA. And I know we've done a lot of work in this space and historically the federal government has stepped in after large natural disasters. Um, and oftentimes municipalities actually end up coming out ahead due to the economic improvements after rebuilding, following some of these natural disasters. So I do know this was fully realized. I just wanted to address it. I do hope that as disclosure improves, uh, that these material physical risks become more and more priced in. Um, and from my perspective, that is going to happen following improvements in both the quality and consistency of data across issuers. So those are my four takeaways. And with that, I'm happy to wrap it up unless there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Alexa. Did we have any questions from the audience? So I think to facilitate um, conversation, David, unless you wanted to chime in. No, no, there were no good questions. There was one. <laughs> there was one specific question, which we'll handle by email about a citation. Sure, sure. Um, so. so I had one question. Um, you know, you provide the dictionary of. Uh, of adaptation related terms. They primarily focus on flood related infrastructure, you know, water, sewer, stormwater improvements or levees. Um, I was curious uh, how you might differentiate between projects that are more like routine capital maintenance or repairs of existing infrastructure, say in budgets or capital budgets versus projects that might be specifically geared towards uh, climate change related adaptation efforts that might be new infrastructure compared to improvements of existing assets. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question, Randy. Um, and this is a really good point and uh, we can't fully disentangle uh, the two in our analysis. Well, the implicit assumption that we take is that there is a constant frequency uh, of um, projects that are repairing the infrastructure, right? So if the city needs to repair the infrastructure, it would always do it like with a certain frequency, while with adaptation, you gotta be adapting more and more. So our research design where we control for the fixed effects of the cities uh, is going to try to take care of this intertemporal variation. But unfortunately, this is the best we can do with kind of sort of this approach where we, you know, what we do currently is we capture how city talks about it, right? And if they're talking, hopefully they don't need to talk too much about the repairs, but if they're talking more about it, it's just some of noise that is introduced into the Right. Makes sense. Um, and somewhat related, you mentioned certain analyses uh, or certain terms, or certain items include terms such as detention storage system, stormwater improvement, you know, and mm -hmm. I guess terms related to specific enterprises. Um, you know, while most do, not all cities manage utilities or enterprises where uh, 
uh, adaptation related language may pop up more frequently, uh, right? Such as stormwater projects or even entire water or sanitary sewer systems. I guess, does the study include any fixed effects, you know, for cities and, and whether or not they operate these types of enterprises? Like a good example in Florida, there's often regional uh, water or stormwater uh, districts, uh, and that's a state obviously exposed to high flood risk. Um, in Louisiana, you know, is another example. A lot of cities don't manage levy infrastructure. They're managed by uh, uh, levy districts. Um, and they raise the, the financing for said levies as well. So I was just curious, um, do you think if taking those items into consideration, if, if they weren't in some kind of fixed effect would make a difference on some of the conclusions? Uh, this is a great question. And actually when we were um, constructing a dictionary, what we did in order to validate the dictionary and was we looked at the most common words and the most common bigrams. Bigrams is just two words that you often go together. And stormwater infrastructure just blows up, right? So uh, due to the reasons that Randy mentioned, you know, there's some uh, districts and subsidies just talk about it because it's an issue for them, right? It doesn't mean necessarily that they are um, preparing or adapting. It's just like a topical issue that comes up in a lot of the financial disclosures. So we made a conscious choice and we tried to be very conservative in constructing our dictionary where we just removed, you know, all the stormwater words that were not explicitly related to the flood risk. So we're trying to get around this issue by kind of being very precise and very narrow, but this is something that definitely came up. Uh, so I'm glad to hear the validations that we did the right thing. It sounds like um, this is something that comes up to practitioners and in practitioners' minds. Randy, I just want to share one comment from an anonymous uh, uh, viewer. He or she points out that Dave Sanchez from the Office of Municipal Securities at the SEC has recently made statements about disclosures on ESG and provided a reminder of what materiality standards apply here. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of this comment, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but we're going to definitely um, look into that. Yeah, it could be related just to the SEC's efforts on expanding ESG-related disclosures, uh, what may get into offering documents. And obviously, the media market is uh, picking this up in their own way through uh, our own regulatory body. Um, and, you know, one other item is, is so kind of summing this up from a policy solution or, or what, you know, this might lead to, um, I thought one of the, you know, interesting findings uh, related adaptation and state uh, grants as a mitigant. Um, you note that in states with uh, larger grants for adaptation related projects, financial constraints aren't necessarily significant in terms of uh, higher levels of adaptation or as political affiliation. Um, uh, so, you know, what, yeah, policy solutions might this entail for states that have, I guess, smaller grants specifically targeted towards adaptation projects or even states already working at this again from a state or regional level. Um, if this is an important area, yeah, what are some reasonable policy solutions if uh, you know, municipalities are, may not have the, the full and complete information just due to some technical limitations. Is there any room for regional or state level collaboration for just uh, tackling some of these challenges? Yeah, thanks for making this not a great day. Uh, we try to be hmm, cautious and not to make um, many policy recommendations because our analysis are more like correlations. But uh, what we find definitely suggests that um, state grants might be helpful in a levy, uh, alleviating the capital constraints, right? So the two findings that Randy talked about is that first, uh, capital constraints bind cities that don't have as much money, don't invest in adaptation as much as the other cities. But at the same time, this relationship is not as strong in states that have large state grants available for the cities uh, for adaptation related efforts. So yeah, could be that if states with sm that have smaller grants expanded their grant um, amounts, it could help the cities potentially, but we can't really claim causality here because we don't know what determines uh, the size of the state um, 
the state say state grants for now. But uh, I agree that it's very interesting associations that just grants further investigation into the matter. We're at time, um, so we'll wrap up this panel. Thank you so much to Anya and Alexa for providing your insights for the uh, interesting paper, continuing to add to this body of research uh, on this kind of emerging topic. So thank you again, we appreciate it. Thanks to you guys both. Thank you. Just want to thank Alexa once again for her helpful comments. Thanks. You're welcome. It was very interesting. Appreciate the time. for our upcoming panelists to join. So the next paper we'll discuss is entitled Climate Race and the Cost of Capital in the Municipal Bond Market. Great. So again, yeah, the, the title of the paper, Climate Race and the Cost of Capital in the Municipal Bond Market uh, on a similar uh, track. There are six contributors to this paper. Among the authors, Erica Small will be presenting, and Evan Kodra will join for the Q&A session. Um, Tom Doe will be our discussant. Uh, Erica is currently a bond analyst at Breckenridge Capital Advisors. She's also completing a PhD in environmental policy at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Erica's research focuses on the relationship between the municipal bond market, and the quality and resiliency of community water services, she works with the water policy team at Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions and supported the recent development and launch of the water affordability dashboard. At Breckenridge, Erica assists the team with the credit analyses and serves as the team's environmental policy expert to guide ESG analysis. Prior to her time at Breckenridge and at Duke, Erica was a water resources engineer in Colorado. Uh, she holds a BS in Civil Engineering from Penn State University and an MS in Civil and Environmental in Engineering from Colorado State University. Uh, Evan is Senior Director of Climate and ESG at ICE Data Services. Evan was a co-founder and CEO of RISC, a Boston-based company acquired by ICE in 2021, focusing on driving climate change adaptation through science and analytics. Evan holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Engineering from Northeastern University. Our discussant, Tom Doe, is the president of Municipal Market Analytics. Tom oversees all operations and analysis generated by Municipal Market Analytics, also known as MMA. MMA provides strategic analysis and commentary on current and historical quantitative conditions for the U.S. municipal market. In addition, the firm performs portfolio credit surveillance and consults industry participants in a variety of capacities. Tom's career has included frequent participation as a speaker and resource industry groups government officials and the media. Tom served a three-year term as a public member on the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. He currently serves or recently served on the advisory boards of Public Wealth, Debtor & Co, Risk, and the Center for Municipal Finance at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Mr. Doe received his undergraduate degree from Colgate University and a master's from Harvard. So with that, Erica, um, we're looking forward to your presentation and take it away. All right, thanks, Randy. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, everyone's good and can see the slides. Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. So once again, um, I just wanna thank the, thanks to Randy and thanks for the, the conference conveners for um, putting together this, this organization, um, this, this event and allowing us to be a part of it. Um, we're really excited to present this work. And a big thank you to all my co-authors, um, Evan Kodra, as mentioned here earlier, and then Adam Stern, Andrew Terrace, and Mike Bonanno of Breckenridge, and then also Martin Doyle with Duke. Um, all right, let's get into it. So we focus on both climate risk and race. And I wanna explain why we're looking at both of those at the same time. So both may certainly affect municipal bond yields and both have started to receive attention in the financial markets, especially with the rise of ESG investing as has been the focus of much of this conference. Um, in addition, there's been acknowledgement of costs from the growing frequency of extreme events and climate change. And then for the race, um, variable, there's definitely been some level of racial reckoning at 
the national level, um, in the national conversation, especially after the killing of George Floyd in 2020. However, both have received relatively limited empirical research in the municipal market space. And I also really want to harp on why we think these questions are super interesting for the municipal market in particular. Um, for climate risk, and this has been brought up a few times today, the municipal market is a really interesting and important venue because issuers are largely considered to be on the front lines of the climate crisis. And what I mean by that is namely that issuers cannot easily re relocate due to adverse impacts of climate change, but then also the residential properties that generate tax revenues to um, repay bond investors are largely underinsured from physical climate risk. Um, and then finally, consideration of multi-year and multi-decade um, trajectories is kind of, is certainly a, a major part of municipal planning and infrastructure planning, and therefore climate is very salient. For race, um, I think it's the municipal market is really interesting to look at because bond proceeds are, you know, by nature invested back into the community of issue. And therefore the geography of each issuer, and I don't just mean the physical geography, I also mean its current and past economic and racial attitudes and policies is inextricably linked with investment decisions. So I believe that we collectively as a community still need more empirical work on one, how the market is responding to this new climate data and climate risk understanding. And then two, how the market might be propagating racial inequities or racial bias. Um, I want to mention too, while I don't specifically cite it here, there was some really great work presented in the earlier session today um, by Ashley Eld Eldermeyer et al. and Serena Loftus et al., um, which specifically looked at two different pathways of discrimination in the municipal bond market for Black Americans and Native Americans. All right, so I don't think I need to convince this audience um, of this, but you know, just for the, the broader viewership, I want to highlight that climate and climate and race are really much more mainstream topics in the financial sector now than they ever were. So we can see some headlines here from some major news sources on climate change and racial justice or equity, and there are many others you could draw on. Um, I, I still find this staggering, even though I work in this space, that current projections are expecting about a third of global financial assets to be ESG focused in just three years, so by 2025. So that's about 50 trillion US dollars. So there's therefore certainly demand from the investor side to better address these risks and issues. But once again, we need better understanding of price implications. All right, so we look at two variables um, in our analysis, or we have two variables of interest. We, we first are looking at physical climate risk, um, and I'll explain exactly what that measure is in a, in a moment. And then we also look at the percentage of the issuer that is Black. So for the cl physical climate risk, some of the recent literature that's been done um, has shown that there's some level of pricing influence for you know, from climate risk in the municipal bond market. However, these studies have largely focused on specific geographies of the United States and or have focused on specific hazards. And they often use climate, um, climate level climate assessments or county level climate assessments. So some of that work is by Painter and then Goldsmith Pinkham. So, uh, you know, a, a big focus has been on sea level rise in coastal communities, and we wanted to look at a broader swath of physical climate risk. We also wanted to look at that at the issuer level, so a little bit more of a refined, refined approach. Um, so we assess issuer level climate risk for combined hurricane, flood, and wildfire risk for the entire continental U.S., and we're therefore not really downscaling these climate risk assessments. We secondarily or you know, additionally focus on the percentage of the service area that is Black because Black Americans have been subject to well-documented racial and economic um, segregation and disenfranchisement, which has had negative income and wealth um, impacts that have persisted for decades. 
we look at racial composition of the service area directly, which has not been done for the whole market, again, with the exception of some work that was talked about earlier today um, in some earlier sessions here. Note that work done by Berg Tresser and Dougal um, and Bruno and Hines have all addressed race and racial discrimination in the municipal bond market, but they have done this somewhat indirectly where they're looking at things such as education bonds issued by historically black colleges and universities. All right, so our conceptual approach is as follows. We have two different data sets and two response variables. So our two data sets are number one, the whole municipal bond market outstanding as of spring of 2022. Um, and that's minus a couple of filters. So we first filter out sinkable bonds. We also filter out private placements. And then we filter bonds with long settle periods. This data set then brings the total number, number of individual securities or individual QCEPs to just over 712,000. We then also look at water and sewer revenue bonds um, only. And the reason we look at water and sewer as a subsector is because there's a very clear direct exposure for water and sewer utilities to physical climate risk. Um, and then also interestingly, kind of regardless of economic status or any racial composition, if you look empirically, historically, um, people pay their water bills and therefore defaults in this sector are exceptionally rare. I believe um, if you look at a recent Moody's report that between 1970 and 2019, there, there's only been two defaults in this sector. For our response variables, um, we first look at the market spread via a cross section of the market in late April of 2022. And these are secondary market evaluations. And then we um, look at the spread at issue. So we look at spread and not yield, um, with spread being the difference between the yield on the bond and a risk-free market rate. So the market spread values are provided directly from Bloomberg's BVAL, and the spread at issue is calculated using the yielded issue and the appropriate um, MMD curve, the municipal market data curve. All right, we test two hypotheses. Um, Hypothesis one is that municipal bonds issued by communities with greater percentage of black individuals pay higher yields on their municipal bonds. And then hypothesis two is that municipal bonds issued by communities with greater physical climate risk do not pay higher yields, but water and sewer bonds issued by those same communities do pay higher yields. This is a, a little diagram as opposed to a, a lot of equations um, to try to explain how we structure our analysis. So we structure our analysis similar to that of a hedonic pricing analysis and our models are fa fairly standard OLS regressions. So for both data sets and both response variables, um, we, we kind of run three separate models and we are adding variables to the models where um, model two includes all the factors or all the variables of model one, and then model three includes all the variables of model one and model two. So we begin by looking at bond structure only in model one, and then in model two, we add um, non-race socioeconomic factors. And then model three, finally, we, look, we add um, both race and climate. Um, I, I can list a lot of the things that we control for when looking at um, the bond structure, and there's a lot. I'll list some of the important ones. So we, we include the years until the bond matures and the issue year, as well as the coupon rate and issue size. We also look at the security for the bonds and the market sector of the bonds um, and the state of issue. We have some dummy variables for its tax status, if it's insured and if it's callable. Um, and then we critically are looking at the bond rating. So for the bond rating, we don't include this as a continuous variable. We include it as a categorical var variable where we're looking at four different categories. So we have high, high investment grade bonds, triple B bonds, non-investment grade bonds, and then unrated bonds. The, the non-race economic variables we add in model two here are um, those that have been pretty well documented to impact credit. 
So these include the Gini index as a measure of income inequality, um, the service area population, and per capita income. And then finally, in model three, we add um, race and climate, where the race is the percentage of the service area that is Black. And the physical climate risk is the, is the risk score or the risk Q score, which some people on this call might be familiar with. So risk Q um, per, is a third party data provider and they aggregate these physical climate risk hazards and give a relative measure on a zero through five scale. For the market spread models, demographic data are from the most recent year available, which in this case is 2020. And we can look at race and climate together because the correlation is relatively minor. The spread at issue models are structured very similarly. Um, the biggest difference is that we also include market condition data, and that's because bonds are issued in different years on different days and market conditions can vary tremendously um, from day to day, week to week, um, certainly year to year. So the market condition data is from Municipal Market Analytics or MMA. And these variables include a measurement of pricing momentum in the market, a measure of evaluation metrics in the market, a measure of flow into or out of mutual funds, which is a good proxy for weekly demand in the market, um, a measure of bids wanted in the secondary, and finally, a measure of par and number of blocks being offered. Additionally, all demographic data are tied to the issue year um, for these models, as opposed to being the most recent year. All right, this table is just a, a summary of all the different data um, sources. So we are using both public and proprietary data where the bond structure data is largely coming from Bloomberg. The climate data and demographic data are coming from risk, um, which is now intercontinental exchange. And then the market condition data is coming from MMA. All right. So here is um, some of our results. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show all of our results. Uh, if time allows or if there's a question, I do have results kind of posted on the end of our slides, which you can see online. Um, so these are showing results here for our regressions for just continuous variables for the whole market data set, so not just water and sewer, for the whole market using spread at issue as the response variable. And all results um, qualitatively show the same thing for both response variables and both data sets. First, contrary to our hypothesis, um, climate risk is not meaningful for the whole market or for water and sewer only. Um, the coefficient is ever so slightly larger for water and sewer only, but it's still not meaningful. Um, so I know you're looking at this and seeing that there, there's, the regression results do show significance for the risk score at the 0.1% level. However, um, a one unit change in the risk score is a significant increase in financial risk from climate related events. So a basis point change of 0.6 per unit change in risk score is not actually consequential. Um, race, on the other hand, is significant and meaningful. And I want to drive home that this, this racial coefficient that we find here, um, which is 0.19 per 1% increase in percent Black of, of, of the issuer, um, that this is after controlling for the bond structure rating and these other economic risk variables. Because this race coefficient was something we really wanted to try to um, dig into more. And because we know that it's difficult to fully disentangle um, the, the variable of race from other socioeconomic variables, we, we ran a robustness test um, where we basically randomize our sample. So what we do is for each QCIP, we maintain all real data except for percent black, which we randomly shuffle, shuffle about at the issuer or QCIP 6 level. And this shuffling breaks any potential real correlations between race and credit spread. We then run this simulated data set through our model with race a thousand different times, and we obtain a Monte Carlo distribution of race coefficients. And these 1,000 randomly simulated coefficients are then compared to our original model finding, which once, once again showed that coefficient of 0.19, meaning that all else equal, 
um, a 100% Black community pays about 19 basis points more on its debt than a 0% Black community. Um, and you can see that number here, this vertical line with the simulations here in this histogram. Um, our, our simulations showed us that at most the coefficient is 0.05 and the median value is somewhere just above zero. Thus, if race did not matter and only economic variables move spreads, we would expect a much lower coefficient on race. All right, so now some concluding points here. Um, so for, for the race piece of our analysis, our study definitely shows um, racial bias in the municipal market that both negatively impacts Black communities and um, Black Americans across the U.S. So the Black penalty that we find means that, again, holding all else equal, a hypothetical community that is 100% Black pays about 19 basis points more on its bonds than one that is 0% Black. And when we aggregate this across the entire municipal market, weighting each issuer by its respective racial composition, this sums to roughly 900 million US dollars annually in additional cost of capital for black Americans across the whole country. That is 900 million um, in aggregate that cannot be invested in these localities, making it harder for predominantly black communities to manage their infrastructure and especially their climate risk. For climate risk, our study shows that climate risk is not yet priced into the municipal market. And that's despite known real cost and revenue impacts from climate change and climate events. The coefficient on the risk score that we find of 0.6 to at most 0.8 means that a change in risk score um, of zero to one of five equates to at most four basis points. So to put that in sort of plain English, that would mean that a change in climate risk exposure from basically the lowest climate risk in the US, um, such as Liberty County, Kansas, to some of the highest climate risk in the US, such as the Florida Keys, only results in a four basis point increase in borrowing costs. And that's practically negligible given the fact that um, a change in risk score from zero to five is about a 32 times increase in insurance equivalent financial risk. Combined, these two results definitely indicate mispricing of risk in the municipal market where climate does not matter, but race does. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Looking forward to the discussion and any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Tom, yeah, we're looking forward to your discussion. Well, it's, it's always good to be part of, oops, excuse me. It's always good to be part of the, the Brookings uh, event. And uh, it's nice to be asked to participate um, on topics that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I'm always reminded as I've listened to other speakers and presentations, uh, for this conference is that provided that, as we say, you know, municipal uh, market data is messy and it's cumbersome and it's awkward to work with. And sometimes it makes it really hard to come up with hard and fast conclusions. But all that being said, I think it's so important at events like this is that we delve into it and try to sort Make, make sense of, of the difficult data and try to come with come up with some themes so that we can strategically um, invest dollars. Um, I think with the whole thing with climate and race, it's I think it's great that these issues come into the financial markets and we and we're addressing them now. Um, I'm not so sure that it's the the markets is you know, responsibility to solve the solutions as in what it certainly does is reflect the um, challenges both of climate and race and and hopefully maybe as we do kind of delve into them and risks are become more pronounced that then there is action that that the financial markets can participate in somewhat of the future um, particularly on the climate side i've now been i think it's in 2018 when i really started to get involved in climate as it pertains to municipals. And it, it just to me seems unconscionable that the municipal industry continues to not price in climate risk that's so well documented now by multitude of data sources 
um, you know, pioneered by um, the folks at risk and now ICE, uh, that is simply not there. And, and Eric is, I think, absolutely right. And is and her work has has echoed, um, reinforced what our anecdotal observation has been over the last four years. Um, that being said, it's it's understandable as to why um, it's not priced in. And I think primarily it's the tax exemption itself. Um, all we have to do is is look simply at the migration patterns over the last four years, and particularly during the pandemic as populations have moved to uh, states that have had uh, less, uh, less of a, a lower, excuse me, having a lower income tax rate, and that the avoidance of taxes is a big driver in people's behavior. And it certainly is a big driver in how the municipal market invests its dollars. And I think that's a lot of the reason, especially in the last two years or in the periods of the, predominantly in the uh, periods when the bonds were issued that, that Erica was looking at, is that there was tremendous demand for tax exempt securities. And the business of the municipal market was to take investor money and invest it in the securities that were available. And when there was a supply demand imbalance, um, risks were ignored and, and the industry has been dealing with that for some time. Um, on, the, on the race side, I think what we're, I think where it is more pronounced and as Erica teased out of the data, that it really is a reflection of the, of the historical discrimination that's been in our country for a long time. And I, th I think this is where the municipal market does play a role in being able to highlight it through the, through the spread relationship. Um, there's no question that minority communities and those that have been disenfranchised are also been denied or uh, the opportunities for economic growth. Um, and that's certainly reflected in their fiscal conditions. And I think that's where you're seeing the spread differential. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as I was reflecting upon the paper was that if the, the spreads that we're seeing on the basis of race might tell us something um, about what the future might be in areas of the country that are also um, start to experience the reverse migration that they've experienced the last few years and people and tax bases start leaving areas of the, of the country. And then for those people that can't move because of economic conditions, is that what are the, those disenfranchised people, um, how do we maintain infrastructure and what's the cost of maintaining infrastructure when the market perceives risk? Um, I think some of the work that, that kind of the uh, complementary work that Chris Berry from the University of Chicago has done on the discriminatory, discriminatory practices around property tax um, certainly echo uh, these kind of challenges that we see in the market. Um, regarding the, the kind of the approach that, that Erica took in the paper, um, there are just a couple things I kind of to add to comment on that I think are important. And while structure and credit were taken into account, I think there's no denying that the, the date that um, she took for that comparison of, of April 27th, which also represented about the low on a price basis in the municipal market. And we all, I think we all know that the municipal market has performed poorly in 2022. And in fact, it's the worst start of the year that we've had since the first half of 1969. And April 27th almost met the, was the bottom um, as, we've, as we've seen. Um, what was important about that or what may influence some of the analysis that, and some of the results is that we're also aware is that three and 4% coupons or bonds were trading at a deep discount also started to be, were trading at a, at a lower price point and therefore a wider spread uh, because of a de minimis penalty. And if we look at the distribution of coupons across the municipal market, inside short of 2035, it's 5% coupon is the dominant, is a predominant coupon. Beyond 2035, it's three, threes and fours with some 2% and some five, mostly threes and fours. So this could skew the spread relationship, especially when you're comparing those same bonds to a 5% benchmark curve which is represented by MMD and BVAL. So, and that's a challenge throughout our market. We don't have a good way of handling that. Our base data becomes, is, is problematic. Um, the benchmark data is problematic and um, the, the eclectic 
coupon structure that's in our in our industry and in our marketplace um, inhibits a lot of analysis, as does the tax exemption itself. Um, the other thing I kept uh, thinking about is we do a lot of work on, at, on secondary breaks. So after a bond is initially priced, when it's released um, from syndicate to trade in the secondary, there is a movement in those bonds and relative to how the general market moves. And that um, out and underperformance relative to the general market after, after the bonds break um, may be a way, of, maybe additional analysis to take a look at, at what the price penalty is at the time of issuance. Um, there's, been, there's been little question in recent years that bonds, when they're priced, in, much like an equity IPO, when they're priced in the primary, they're priced at a higher yield in order to have the bonds clear. And then when they break in the secondary, they move to a lower yield. So that would also be a way of measuring the degree of penalty the issuer experiences um, uh, uh, as a result of either race or climate. Um, the other th thought I had was, um, again, looking at what credit sectors are such a big driver in the, in the municipal market. We look at 32 different credit sectors. Um, Erica broke out the water and sewer. I think we could go through all 32 sectors and divide up the market to take a little bit closer analysis, again, of overlaying race and also overlaying climate. Um, and then uh, the, the other item I, I guess I also thought about was then also looking not just at, again, these two price points, the, the time of issuance and then that April 27th, I think creates some uh, challenges in terms of the interpretation of the data. But I also kept thinking is, I'd also be interested in looking at what would the issuance size, um, looking at states that were uh, issuing in tax sensitive states where investors might have greater interest in the bonds or not based on the tax um, uh, structure within a particular state. Um, the other thing is also looking at how these bonds trade in the secondary and looking at block size. Does in, are institutional blocks trading differently than in, in retail size blocks? And can get an idea of what is the investor perception of climate and race um, and see who is the driver there. Is it the many the many purchasers, purchasers through the as retail investors, or is it really the large institutions that are setting the tone? And um, I think you know. And then I think I thought the last thing I would take a look at is start looking at the underwriter and the bond council, um, and seeing what the advice that the issuer is getting, or what's the what's the risk capability of the underwriter who's involved with these different credits, and um, and to the extent that bonds that are being penalized or have a wider spreads because of a, of a race um, descriptor, um, do they attract a different underwriter and is that a different risk to manage? So those are kind of my thoughts, good or bad, um, on, on, the, on the paper. Um, I found it you know, incredibly uh, interesting and engaging. I think it's like all, like as I said at the onset, you know, and everyone knows municipal data is messy. It's complex. Um, Supply demand is a big driver. The tax exemption inhibits a lot of price discovery and, um, and just the absence of, of actively trading of the bonds also inhibits the price discovery and the limited data points that, were, that where the market is pricing and we're dependent again on the evaluation measures that are provided um, by third parties. But as always, um, conferences and are engaging, uh, engage ideas and uh, gives us a basis to move forward and think creatively about our industry. So uh, kudos to Erica as the lead author and all those involved. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Interesting insights. Uh, I think many of us in the industry have uh, similar sentiments on that front. Um, I wanted to touch on one thing you raised that I, I do think would be interesting to see given some of the nuances in the muni market. Um, it, and it's partly related to this conference as well. So a few other papers uh, over the past couple of days have highlighted the unique ownership composition of the muni market, right? With the lion's share held by retail investors in contrast to institutional investors for other types of debt markets. I mean, do you think the composition of buyers could explain some of that variation in pricing uh, from racial composition or climate race, right? I guess maybe with the, the thought that these retail investors tend to be from households that are generally wealthy and can take full advantage of the, the tax benefits from the market. One likes higher yields. So the extent that the 
that raises creating a higher wider spreads and higher yields is something that the that from the investor community they may be apt to um, you know ignore right they're not out to correct that that issue it's kind of like disclosure right not everybody wants everyone talks about having good disclosure not everybody wants it because bad disclosure can mean higher yield and that can be good from an investor perspective yeah can i rank can i just lay on that randy i'm kind of puzzled by the market failure here given that so much of the muni bond market as i understand it the retail investors are buying through mutual funds and if you buy a muni mutual fund you have no idea what's in it i mean i know they disclose it but i'm sure no investor looks at it so i'm just puzzled by the market failure if i could really get a higher yield by buying bonds of largely black communities without taking more risk. Why isn't that happening? I'm just sort of puzzled by how this market works. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that, Tom or Eric. Erica, what's your answer? I mean, I want to hear Erica's answer. So why, why is the market not exploiting that? Exactly. I actually don't think that in, there's ever been I think the market's been in somewhat of a denial of that that exists. Um, I don't think this is something that is that is largely accepted in the market that you can, for the same effective risk, um, you could receive a higher yield by just investing in a more black community. I just don't. I just don't think that's widely known or and certainly widely accepted. I think if you look at what the issuer is and look at the the, the amount of issues specifically. Um, that have a racial, you know, component or penalty to it. It might be interested what the the entire you know, par outstanding of those issues are. Um, it may or may not be a lot. I, I wasn't quite sure. Eric, you may have a comment on that. Yeah, um, I don't have a comment specifically on that, Tom. But I I do want to just pick up on something that you brought up with the secondary. And this was something I didn't really totally realize until I was in the world of asset management, just how infrequently so many of so much of our market trades. Um, and so I just do think that there's, there's much more, um, there's just much more opaqueness in the market and not just because of what's included or not included in disclosures. Um, it's just, there's just a, less frequency of, of transactions that can give really good quality data on these sorts of, of price implications. Well, as you pointed out, Eric, you know, the, the challenges with all the data is that it's, um, it, the comparison to residential real estate is so apt and the, um, the ability to have good evaluation, I mean, right, you know, 1% trades and the market, all these QCIPs that you have outstanding are basically priced off a, a thousand institutional blocks that trade each day. So it's amazing what we, we as an industry have to extrapolate out in order to create daily data in which to do any type of analysis. Um, there's also, it might be interesting too, to do a comparison of taxable and tax exempt municipal bonds to see by eliminating the exemption as a variable as to whether taxable municipals that have a racial bias also have a different trading pattern than those who do not. Yep, that's good. I mean, we control for the tax status, but um, being more explicit and breaking those out as two subgroups would be a, a interesting analysis. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for your comments. We are a couple minutes over time here. If you have any questions, please reach out to the authors. Uh, we didn't get to hear from Evan, unfortunately, because he's a wealth of knowledge on uh, Time related information. So please, uh, you know, if you, if you were missing that part of the conversation, uh, open up the dialogue. But thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll take a, a short break and we'll readjourn at 1:50 Eastern for an overview of uh, infrastructure spending and state and local governments. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thanks, Randy.
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center at Brookings. On behalf of my colleagues here and at Washington University, at Brandeis, and at uh, University of Chicago, I want to welcome you to the final session, but not by any means the least important session of our uh, annual municipal finance conference. Uh, we're going to talk today about the outlook for state and local infrastructure spending. I think it's well known to everybody in this group that uh, state and local governments own much and do of the infrastructure, physical infrastructure in the United States, and do much of the infrastructure investment. And I think that the best data I've looked at suggests that um, the the uh, trend before the pandemic was for as a share of GDP both federal, state, and local infrastructure spending have been on a downward trend. Um, of course, there's been substantial political appetite to reverse that, most notably in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, um, that uh, allocated, uh, would increase federal spending on infrastructure, physical infrastructure above the baseline by about $550 billion over the next decade. And there's money in this bill from bro for broadband, transportation, water, and a host of other things. I want to note that um, uh, we here at, at Brookings uh, do not want to suggest that investing in human in uh, capital is unimportant. We think that investments, is particularly in children, is crucial to our future economic growth. But for today's discussion, we're going to focus mainly on physical infrastructure. And I think we have some conflicting forces. On one hand, there is all this federal money, if they can get it out of Washington and into the hands of state and local governments so it can be spent. State and local governments are in fairly good shape as a whole, um, but we are now seeing rising interest rates, which of course, of course make it more expensive for state and local governments to borrow to pursue federal, to pursue, pursue infrastructure spending. So we have actually a great plan today. We've tried to get several different perspectives. Uh, let me introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, Ryan Burney is a senior advisor to Mitch Landrew, the infrastructure implementation coordinator in the White House. He previously worked for Landrew in the city government in New Orleans. And before that, he worked for James Carville, which I think could probably be a 45 minute session in and of itself. Um, DJ Gribben's uh, resume is so long that if I read it all, it would take all 45 minutes. He's had a number of roles in the public and private sector. Most relevant for this conversation, he was a special assistant to President Trump for infrastructure in 2017 and 18, and previously was general counsel at the Department of Transportation, the federal one, and a chief counsel at the Federal Highway Administration. He's also worked in the private sector for quite a while for Macquarie Group, and is now at Stone Speak Infrastructure Partners and at his own firm called Madras. Uh, Shoshana Liu has been executive director of the Colorado Department of Transportation since December 2018. Previously, she was at the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, but she's also been at the U.S. Department of Transportation and at the Office of Management and Budget and the Domestic Policy Council in the White House. And Eden Perry is the head of the U.S. Public Finance uh, Operation at S&P Global Ratings. Unlike everybody else on this call, she hasn't changed jobs very much. She's been at um, S&P for more than 20 years. Um, so with that, we're gonna go right into the discussion. If anybody has questions, as we said before, you can go to the website slido, sli.do, hashtag muni finance and put your questions in there. And we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, Ryan tells me he's joining from by phone, but uh, I think that should work. Um, I thought I'd start with you, Eden Perry, if I might. Um, so compared to say the pre-pandemic years and the pandemic years of 20, uh, 2021, what do you see ahead for local and state infrastructure spending in terms of volume types and how responsive is in the current environment, especially given rising interest rates, the muni bond market to funding infrastructure projects? Thank you, David. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, my first time being at Brookings, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so what we're seeing so far, uh, I think I was on a prior panel and I heard someone say this, this has been a pretty rough year for the municipal bond market in terms of volume. Um, it, we're down significantly from the last two years, but they were very strong volume years. This year we're seeing um, 
real drop off in the volume in the municipal market. But that's actually because we had really strong years in terms of refunding activity. And this year, we're actually seeing um, the market being driven by new activity, by uh, new issuance. So this year, new issuance as of May was up to was up at uh, 139 billion, and that was more than 10 billion from the last year and 20 billion the two prior years. So we are actually seeing a lot of new activity in the municipal bond, bond market, and that's not surprising given given what you already alluded to the um, Inve infrastructure investment and job act. So um, the biggest growth that we saw so far this year is in the utility sector, whereas the other sectors primarily have been down a bit. Um, what we're expecting is continued growth, actually, in terms of new issuance. It might not be actually new issuance in capital spending. A lot of it will probably be pay-as-you-go capital spending. And um, it shouldn't be surprising, given the level of infrastructure projects that are still needed across the country, the, um, the, invest the IIJA and also the American Rescue Plan Act. And then also the still relatively low um, interest rate environment. And I think a lot of issuers are still wanting to get into the debt market prior to the interest rates rising. However, we noted in a recent report that we just released earlier this month called Increase in U.S. State Debt Levels in 2021 was a blip, published earlier this month. Total debt date increased by 4% in 2021. And that's actually a real departure from prior trends. And it's not something that we expect to continue due to the influx, flux, influx of federal aid across debt states which has increased the push to fund capital projects on a pay-as-you-go basis. According to NASBO, states increased capital spending on infrastructure by 9.1% in fiscal 2021, and that was the strongest growth in 15 years, but 72% of that was pay-as-you-go funding. And we expect this level to remain high over the next several years, given the federal aid funding that states and local governments received. Mm -hmm. D discussing that, uh, the tr trillion dollar dollars in the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Act we're expecting that to, to, to fund primarily traditional infrastructure needs across the states, roads, bridges, airports, transit, rail, but the bill also targeted, targeted risks related to resiliency, energy transition, electric charging stations, and cybersecurity. But the largest portion, 284 billion, was for transportation, which is something that we see often in the, in the municipal bond sector and is always well-received. Um, in terms of resiliency, we're expecting the focus to be on improved power grid effectiveness, reduce wildfire fire risk, and to ensure Western water availability. The existing program certainty will also fund, we saw the fund setting for five years of highway trust fund, drinking water and clean water state revolving funds, and then, then there was $1.25 billion for cybersecurity. But in terms of what you were talking in your introduction going forward, we expect to see depends on a few factors, which should be sur not surprising to anyone here on the panel. What happens with inflation, supply side disruption, the difficulty finding workers for projects, the increased wages for workers. And what we're expecting because of this is we're expecting that states and local governments may be changing the scopes of projects, focusing on smaller, more impactful projects, or even some states and local governments are st stretching out the timing if possible. And last, I've, we've been hearing some discussion of trying to get the federal reimbursement for some of these project costs. Um, all of the projects that we've discussed would be well received with the municipal market. These are projects that are really the staple and the bread and, bubble, bread and butter of the public finance community. There was a, a report issued about a year ago from our chief economist, Beth Ann Bavino. The report was entitled How U.S. Infrastructure Investment Would Boost Jobs, Productivity, and the Economy. And a few takeaways from that piece is that a trillion dollar investment like the IIJA would add $1.4 trillion to the economy over an eight-year period or a fiscal multiplier of 1.4 times. And the private sector productivity would boost be boosted around 10 basis points on average per year. And in terms of job creation, it would be over 883,000 jobs, mainly in the middle class. And per capita income would increase by 10.5% with this type of investment. And these types of outcomes are always welcome in the municipal market. The municipal community likes stability and they like economic growth. Just want to clarify one thing. When you say pay as you go, you mean instead of borrowing, they use current revenues to pay exactly, for exactly. Yeah, that's a term we um, use often. Yeah, just want to clarify. So, Shoshana, I know we can't see you, but I understand you can hear us and we can hear you. Is that right? You're on mute, so I can't. Sorry, there are folks trying to fix my video, uh, but yes, can you hear? Me? We can hear you loud. Me okay. So, how does the world look from California, uh, from Colorado? Are you flooded with federal money? What are you spending it on? And 
when you look ahead for the next couple of years, what are the issues that worry you? Oh, uh, I, I would I would say the view from Colorado is uh, superior to the other seas. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a mix, right? And you know, in Colorado, we're lucky to have a policy environment where our state legislature and governor work together on a funding package that actually preceded the federal package. So we are dealing, you know, with a confluence of the work that we did a year prior to the federal bill with the additional resources that came um, following following that and those coming together in a way that is uh, is allowing us to pay for a lot more than we would have before. You know, the, the uh, slightly tempered upside to, uh, and downside is that the formula funding from the federal um, allocation is significant, but it doesn't change our annual uh, amount by an order of magnitude. You know, it gives us roughly, you know, on average, say we get an extra year to year and a half worth of funding over the five-year period of the bill, which is a lot, but it's not enough to uh, kind of wholly change the order of magnitude of the program. Um, when you combine that with what we did for ourselves first uh, through the state package, it's enough to really get our capital plan done if we stay disciplined. So, you know, the view is a good one, but it's also one where we have to manage expectations because if we don't stay focused on building the plan we have, that amount of money could dissipate quickly. So the, you know, what we're doing is we quickly plugged the resources in um, to the plan that we had been developing for a matter of years and are just kind of going through it in an orderly fashion and you know, trying to make sure that the public can see the results of what we do. You know, of course, the economy right now you know, means that there's some variability in the pricing of projects and sort of figuring out what can come in relatively close to the original budget is another uh, vector of this exercise. But you know, it's 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 a lot of the accountability and project management work of making sure that we um, are clear about where dollars are going, how much is available for projects, and we build scope to the dollars we have. And are you getting enough guidance from Washington on the discretionary part of the IIJA? Um, there are an awful lot of federal uh, discretionary programs now. Um, some of them are new. Some of them are variants of ones that have been uh, around for several years. And you know, I think by and large what we are trying to do is figure out how to um, write a finite number of good applications and focus what we're applying for, again, on getting our sort of holistic vision done. You know, I think there's, um, the, the uh, our federal friends have a hard uh, set of challenges on their plate delivering all of these new programs. You know, I would applaud DOT for trying to combine the sources where they can. You know, they put out a single funding notice in one instance for three different programs so that instead of having to apply three times, we could do it once. You know, the more they can do that, the easier it is for people where we sit to actually avail ourselves of those programs. Um, you know, I think on the back end, how they project manage those could be challenging if it's not very organized because um, the dollars will flow through different operating administrations with different rules. So making sure that you know, they're as, as adherent to consolidation on the back end as they've been on the front end, I think will be important. But uh, considering the magnitude of new programs, they're getting those out quickly and uh, we're applying for them. Hmm. Thanks. So Ryan, tell us what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong in the administration. <laughs> well, for once, we actually uh, have money to, to dole out to states and cities. Um, uh, it, it wasn't that long ago when I was deputy mayor of New Orleans dealing with DJ and we we're talking about a lot of P3 opportunities, but not a lot of real money. And, and now we have this once in a generation opportunity to really push uh, into cities and states primarily. 90% of the funding is going to be spent by states and cities. Um, very little of the money is, is spent by uh, you know, the federal government and, and direct spend. Um, we've really been focused on just getting organized to set up everyone for success. We view this as a five to seven year uh, endeavor. And in many instances, the money will be spent 10 and 12 years out um, given, given the way that things work. Um, we have uh, really started to build a team at the White House to focus on project delivery, focus on uh, setting up the right structures. We've Each state has appointed a state infrastructure coordinator at our direction um, with one or two exceptions. Um, and we're working really hard on making sure that low capacity communities have the resources needed to both plan for and uh, apply for funding. The bill, um, as Shoshana just referenced and, and she knows better than most is 375 programs 125 of them are brand new um, yeah. and most of those are competitive and just the process of setting up those the mechanisms the staff i mean one of the biggest things we're doing 
is hiring federal agency staff to be able to process paperwork and reviews and, and to write all the front end. I mean, the, the Department of Energy went from a primarily research and development based organization to now having $60 billion to spend on clean energy infrastructure um, and overnight. So they've had to create an entire new undersecretariat, a new undersecretary, whole new uh, offices. Um, and so a lot of our early efforts have been spent there. We've pushed out $110 billion to date in announcements. Um, the obligations and outlays follow uh, in order. Um, we've rolled out a lot of the major programs that are formula based that uh, are a lot of existing programs that maybe have some tweaks and changes, maybe a new climate lens, maybe a new equity lens, but primarily primarily existing funds. And then we're moving now into rolling out a lot of these clean energy programs, grid resilience programs um, to be coming this summer. And then we're, we're now making awards. So uh, uh, two weeks ago, we announced a billion dollars of uh, grants to airports for airport terminals the first time the federal government has invested in terminals themselves, typically the federal investments in runways and, uh, you know, uh, control towers and stuff like that. Um, in a few weeks, we'll have uh, announcements for the RAISE program, which is one of the most popular uh, transportation programs that's competitive for, for cities. And so, you know, we really feel like we've hit the ground running. We've got a good process in place, got a good team and structure set up. Uh, and as Shoshana can attest, because uh, we had a call with her on Friday. We're also really focused on like, how do we actually build things again in this country? Um, and, and maybe not even act like we ever got it right in the first place. How do we actually reconstruct the process to be able to make the system work better so that, um, you know, this, this doesn't have to be just a once in a generation opportunity. We, we can prove and be successful and hopefully Congress will act um, to continue to give us money. In the future. That, that's a, you raise a good point. I once heard a, um, a, a trademark Rahm Emanuel rant about how hard it was. I think DJ was at that event, actually, how hard it was to get anything built in Chicago and pleading with Washington to help basically override uh, a lot of local and state uh, rules in order to just get things done. Have you thought at all about why it takes so long to build things in the U.S. and how expensive it is, and what we might do at the federal level to to streamline yeah. the process. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there are a lot of different inputs there. Um, I would say a lot of folks get focused and and sometimes stuck on the permitting piece. But we we have released a permitting action plan. We are doing all the kind of best practice things of coordination, public timelines, full transparency to really lean in on that piece. But there, you know, there's contracting math methodologies. There's just litigation risk here. Um, there's, you know, the more community engagement you have on the front end, the better it is on the back end. I mean, there, there are a lot of things. So one of the things we're actually going to do this fall is uh, host a kind of project delivery summit of best practices, kind of lift up. Here are some good examples of projects that have really worked well um, and how we, you know, deliver them. M Mitch's mantra is on time, on task, under budget. Um any one of those things would be pretty hard to do. Um, and we're trying to do all three. Um, but, you know, that is our, that's our goal. And so we are really, um, it kind of gets driven and beat into everybody's heads day in and day out. And we're working with states. I mean, as you mentioned, a lot of this is uh, not just federal regulations and rules. A lot of it happens with the layering of uh, federal, uh, state and local. Um, and so we're working up and down the stream. We worked with the state of Michigan, for example, on its own permitting action plan. To kind of mirror some of the things that we're doing uh, here and and at the federal government level. Thanks. So, DJ, I remember talking to you when you were in the White House, and I think you said your job was to explain. The president wanted you to figure out a way to, if he gave you a nickel on infrastructure, you should turn it into twenty five cents. Um, you didn't have the advantage that Ryan has that Congress actually put some money into this. Right. So, I basically have two questions with you. One is. Given all the things we've just talked about with Ryan, how do you think this administration is doing? And then secondly, to what extent do you think we'll stop, we'll do more than talk about public-private partnerships in this space? David, those are, are two really good questions. And I'll, I'll start with the first one, how the administration is doing. And Ryan, I will save some rebuttal time for you at the end of my comments in case you want to come back <laughs> and disagree with whatever I just have to say. Um, I'm going to split up the analysis into two parts, politics and policy, in terms of how the administration is doing. 
um, on the politics side, given a, like they're doing a phenomenal job. As Ryan mentioned, they're talking about, we passed a bill with money in, then we're making the money available. Now we've got a NOFO. Now we're taking formula funds and applying to this project. They've done a phenomenal job in kind of building public's confidence that this money that's been invested in infrastructure is actually being deployed and moving and moving well. I'd also give the administration points uh, for bringing Mitch Landry and Ryan on board. I mean, there, there is a world of difference, and Shoshana knows this as well, from being a federal policy person and being a recipient on the sort of the receiving ends of those policies and uh, having a team with their experience and other people's experience along those lines, very, very helpful. Um, communicating, I think they're using Secretary Bedej really well. As, you know, so it's important as everyone can appreciate to not only have a nice law, but also to go out and make sure the public understands what you're doing with that. And I think in terms of communicating to the public and communicating with potential grant recipients at the st state and local level, administration is doing a fi fabulous job. Um, uh, the second part in addition to politics, we're talking about policy. And while uh, you know, getting a bill passed, kudos administration for getting a bill passed, obviously something we weren't able to do, that bill is a hot mess. And I think Ryan is being polite. Um, David, you mentioned in your book about opportunity zones, how if you have an idea that's really innovative and creative, but you sort of toss it into a big piece of legislation at the very end of the process, it doesn't work well. Now, remember where this bill came from, right? This is like two handfuls of senators that got together, uh, you know, almost like got together over beers and threw a bunch of stuff that was on the shelf into a bill, sent it to the House. The House did nothing with it, passed it. And now we've got 135 new grant programs. Uh, and as Ryan touched on, my gosh, we tried to do one program, the Urban Partnership Agreement in the Bush administration. And that was incredibly difficult. Uh, this bill has a competitive program for culverts. And I don't know who the head of the culvert lobby is that got this in there, but that person should get a huge bonus. For those who don't know, a culvert is a pipe that goes underneath a road or a railroad to just channel water away from the infrastructure. There's now a new federal competitive grant program for culverts. Um, so there's going to be lots of programs, lots of money, lots of chaos. I would also differ a little bit with Ryan on the uh, permitting action plan the administration had. And Ryan, I am one of those people that fixates a little bit on the permitting process because, again, all the jobs, all the economic developments, all of the, you know, the social equity we're looking for and all that, none of that happens unless the money is actually spent on a project and you can't spend any money until you're permitted. And the permitting action plan creates eight new uh, intergovernmental agencies, has 10 new sort of guidance regulatory requirements, including new regulation, and has eight new reporting requirements for every agency to have. And this seems to be almost like a faith-based approach to permitting, where we're going to have a plan and we're going to want it to go faster, but they're going to create lots of layers of activity, which in my experience in government, never makes anything go faster. So it's, it's good, and then it creates lots of communications, but every one of those communications takes time, takes effort. And my gosh, we have a, like the world's slowest permitting plan in one of the developed countries already. Do we really need it to be any slower? Um, one thing that's a little counterintuitive when it comes to infrastructure is you think getting communities more involved is always a good thing. And, and usually it is. But one of the things I worry about is all of this communication and money going directly to communities, it could end up taking the NIMBY program, which is you know not in my backyard where no one wants to structure in the backyard, and create a new NIMBY, and they're not creating a new NIMC program, which is like not my community, where we're handing communities vetoes over you know critical roads or transmission or whatever long linear infrastructure we're trying to build. So I'll, I'll wrap up by saying I think. Phenomenal job on the politics side. On the policy side, they've been handed a disaster of a bill. Um, they're applying lots of new regulations and new sort of systems in place that almost as surely will slow it down. And I was really comforted to hear Ryan saying, like, money's not going to be spent for, uh, you know, seven, ten years. I'm actually more optimistic than that. I think it will be spent sooner than that, but it's going to be five, six, seven years. And that's going to bump into the public perception that this bill has passed, money is available, now our infrastructure problems will be solved. You're on mute. 
stop you there and get to the public-private partnership in a minute. So Ryan, I don't want to hear your commentary on what the Congress did, because I don't think you'd be tell us the truth anyways. But do you want to respond to DJ's comments about how you've administered the thing? And Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think he was even really making a comment about how we administered. I mean, I think, look, we have gotten $110 billion announced that money is going out to spend uh, on projects. We are breaking ground on projects that are going to the ground. Um, one of the, uh, one of the positive things I think about the structure of the bill, particularly in the formula funding is that they did sp spread out money over five year increments. And so that is why you will have, um, if people are not getting money five years, five fiscal years out, which is if six years out, um, and they're planning for it, that those projects take, you know, two to three, five years, depending on what it is, uh, which of course we have to make, make work better. You know, that's how you get to the 10 years out mark. Um, I will say, you know, there's not an area of the bill. Um, it is it is a lot. Uh, I don't think anybody would uh, dispute uh, that it's a lot. I mean, they're kind of kind of 12 core areas, but with 375 programs, you've got a lot in it. Um, but these are these are areas that have been significantly underrested in for centuries. I mean, our infrastructure is not just our roads and bridges. Um, it is our water systems that are failing. It is the high speed Internet that is like critical to everything we do in uh, the world today um, and, and don't have to sit through the last two years, two and a half years to know that. Um, and so, you know, cleaning up the legacy pollution, investing in clean energy, those that is really the crux of what the, the bill does. Um, and so, you know, those programs all fit into those kind of those loose buckets um, this, so I, that, that would be my only, my only point. And, and look on the permitting action plan, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of agreement about the types of things that work. Um, and we're, we're really committed to just making sure that it's a priority. It's one of the first things we rolled out, uh, two, two things. One was working with inspectors general, um, and the GAO to make sure there was no waste, fraud, abuse. And the second thing was, uh, developing a permitting action plan because we have to be able to build things better and faster in this country. It's just, that's a, that's a fact. And you don't have to be a Republican or Democrat to agree with that statement. So. So Shoshana, can you pick up on that? How do you handle uh, permitting in Colorado? How do you deal with the nimbyism and the fact that our system makes it so easy for someone who doesn't like a project to litigate it? I mean, in, in my own backyard in Washington, there's just examples, one example after another of things that get drawn out, including a, a new metro line, just by by just endless litigation by people who seem to have endless amounts of money to spend on lawyers. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting and longstanding question where you can uh, kind of argue it a few different ways with different projects. I mean, just to kind of um, set the framework, what we call permitting is really probably a consolidation of hundreds of different decisions, right? I mean, it's everything from implementation of the Clean Air Act and the National Environmental Policy Act to, you know, by America and Davis Bacon to local um, authorities that bring to bear even on projects at other levels of government sometimes. You know, here, some of the municipalities will sometimes invoke a rule that gives them sort of a permitting uh, process in our projects. And the landscape differs in different places. And, you know, there are pros and cons to each of these processes like there are to everything. You know, my, my view is that sometimes the National Environmental Policy Act gets a bad rap on projects. Um, and that if you're strategic about how you implement it, it can actually help to solve problems rather than create them. I mean, to use an example, and this is one that DJ knows well, you know, we have a project that's coming to closure in Denver now. Um, the, the segment of Interstate 70 that uh, goes through the city where it was uh, deliberated upon for about a decade before it actually got a shovel in the ground. You know, on the face of it, you could say, darn it, the permitting process took too long. If you dig beneath the surface on that project, part of what happened is that the agency that I now run um, you know, really pushed back on taking community concerns seriously. When everybody finally got to the table and dealt with what were real concerns about the what it would do to the fabric of the neighborhood seriously, they were able to reach a resolution and the execution of the project has actually um, gone off pretty smoothly since it got under construction. You know, what we learned from that was that we actually needed to change the way the process works to make us do more at the beginning so that you work through that stuff, you know, in year one, not in year nine, right? I mean, if you're gonna end up doing 
things like air quality monitoring, which is actually a best practice um, to understand the implications of a project, do it at the beginning and don't argue about it for eight years. You know, that doesn't solve everything. I, I don't think that would have fixed the purple line, right? The issues there are a little bit different. Um, but I think there's a way to structure the way we execute these processes so that they become um, kind of uh, frameworks for solving problems instead of uh, creating them. You know, one interesting point on that is that there's a few different ways to do some of these permitting processes. And sometimes the intuitive thing is to do the fastest one, but that's also um, creates litigation risk. Whereas if you're going to have a controversial project, you're actually better off acknowledging that it's controversial from the beginning and going through a somewhat more extensive process that inoculates you a bit more on the back end from litigation because of the nature of how um, how you document the process. So, you know, long, long, long story short, uh, you know, be clear about what the obstacles are going to be, be honest in the risk registers and how you, you know, are, are candid about who likes it and who doesn't like it. You know, try and bring everybody to the table, whether or not they agree at the beginning. And, um, you know, I think the more organized you are about troubleshooting um, one challenge after the other, the more it uh, gets to closure. And sometimes the projects that take long have fundamental problems. Mm. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. So Eden, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, climate change. And I have two questions. One is, does the muni bond market fully reflect the risks that climate change poses to some communities? And secondly, is there enough e ESG appetite to reward municipalities that are doing resilience projects with lower yields, or is it just more of a talking point? Um, it's a great question, and it's an area where I think, you know, I think it's somewhere in between, right? right. You, you know, I think that knowing how you appropriately model these risks is an area of practice that is not as mature as I think it will be 10 years from now, right? Whether that's the um, air, air pollution impacts that affect people who live in the neighborhood and breathe the air, or whether that's how likely your road is to wash out because of a flood or a mudslide or a fire, you know, things that are unfortunately affecting places all over the country, depending on what your risks are. You know, here it's more about rockfall and mudslides, um, right. due, you know, due to the mountain environment in Florida or, you know, even New York or Maryland, it's going to be more about the flood risk. Right. You know, I think those, those things, the risks to infrastructure are very real and, you know, we're going to have to get better at, being honest about what they are and the cost benefit of doing projects when they entail some of these risks and frankly knowing what we can control against and what we can't. Um, Eden, Eden, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, David, can you repeat the first part of your question again? Because I just so want to try to answer is, it. Um, does the mini bond market fully take account of uh, the risks that climate change poses to some municipalities, the ones that are most vulnerable? And secondly, yeah. is there any does, does the market reward, does it, is there enough appetite for ESG and is it is green well enough to find so that you get some benefit when you do a resiliency project or is it all just homogenous, you know, so, about dollars and cents? So in terms of the first question, I think it's complicated because one thing, I, you had an earlier panel that talked about disclosure in the municipal market. I think the disclosure is really difficult. And I think there's been a lot of work in that area. I think there's a lot of new data that's come out. There's a lot of different sources, different vendors that are working towards get, get, getting, getting better ESG disclosure. However, I don't think ESG is something new. I think this is something, that the terminology is new, talking about environmental, social, and governance is new terminology, but it's actually something that we've looked at for years and years. I've been doing this for 20 years. We have been asking governments forever about droughts, about floods, about wildfires. This is actually nothing new about, you know, conservation is not new. Um, it's just a new terminology to talk about environmental. Uh, social is not new. We've talked about demographics forever. That's been in our criteria forever. If you have a declining population, that affects your ability to have economic growth. Uh, so it's just a new term. Uh, governance is not new. We've talked about management forever. Management is a key rating factor and always has been for us since I started rating bonds. So I just think the terminology is new and it's become a very you know hot button item. But this is not, none of these factors are new. This has been in our criteria. We've looked at this since I became a rating analyst in 2001. Um, so uh, so I, I don't know if that answered your first question, I, but I do think it is something that we've always looked at. And I do think governments have focused on this. They've, you know, I remember rating bonds in 2001 and talking to different places in North Carolina. They didn't have chief resiliency officers, but they had capital plans that dealt with floods or that dealt with 
different, is, in, different issues that they now deal with today that they might have a chief resiliency officer who is focusing on. Um, hmm. So uh, I, I do think, uh, what was the second question? So I can- well, Let's, hold, let's off, hold off on the second one. I'll come okay. back to it. Okay. Brian, um, there's a question on the chat that uh, you hear a lot. I could answer it, but I'm gonna let you do it, which is, isn't spending all this money on infrastructure at a time when we have inflation just gonna make inflation worse? Well, again, this goes back to the structure of the bill. So the answer is no. One, um, and, and outside folks have definitely said, yeah, sure, of course, spending any bit of money right now may be inflationary, but the, the impact of this bill uh, is, is uh, positive um, on the inflation issue for a couple of reasons. One is we actually are, are actually going to fix the supply chains that have created a lot of the, the situation that we have today in ports and rail um, and, and airports and railways, it increased the productive capacity of the economy um, with a lot of what we have. The second thing is we're actually just not spending that much money in this current fiscal, in this current year. Um, a lot of the money, as, as you know, said, goes in the out years. Um, and then there was actually a bunch of uh, programs that are actually designed to specifically lower costs for people in the immediate term, like the lower um, cost internet program or weatherization or energy efficiency, which um, ultimately we think is, is uh, good on all those fronts. Hmm. So DJ, um, I, public-private partnerships may be a phrase that's used at least as often as ESG. And I wonder, what does it actually mean in practice? So the federal government's gonna pump all this money in. Is this something where we're gonna see public-private partnerships or is the public money basically crowding out the private here? Um, I think it's a little bit more of the latter, to be honest with you. So public-private partnerships, for those who aren't familiar with it, in essence, it's a broad phrase that, that includes uh, a number of procurement methods whereby the public sector that owns, as David mentioned, you know, Infrastructure America's own, you, almost exclusively at the state and local level, where those state and local governments invite a private party in to accept more risk than a traditional procurement in exchange for the private party investing in that infrastructure and actually using private equity. Uh, very, very important to note that private equity is not free. You have to pay it back. Uh, there is a common misperception that uh, public-private partners will bring more funding into infrastructure. It actually doesn't bring more funding, it brings more financing tools so the states can accelerate these projects. At the end of the day, infrastructure funding comes from two sources, users and taxpayers, full stop, that's it. Um, so if you're using private equity, you have to pay it back from taxpayers or from users of the facility. I think it's gonna be crowding out in two ways. Uh, first of all, as everyone has mentioned, you know, the, there's more funding and, and Shoshana's point's dead on, which it's not this tidal wave and tsunami of funding, but it's you know 29% more in the highway area, transportation area. So significantly more funding available. So there's less need to look for financing alternatives than, than you might have otherwise. Um, and then secondly, crowding out in terms of time. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Shoshana's team and, and other state DOTs and cities and counties across America are, are getting their teams to focus on how do we apply for federal funding and grants as opposed to how do we think of new innovative ways to involve the private sector in funding these, this infrastructure. So there's probably two levels of crowding out. It'll still be an important tool. It applies really just to a relatively small subset of infrastructure projects. So um, it's, it's a great tool to have in the toolbox. It can be useful, but uh, it can, the current environment, given the amount of cash that's coming in and the need to hustle pretty aggressively for the competitive grant programs, it's unlikely we'll see a significant uptick in public private partnerships. Hmm. I see and you now. David, I just like to, yeah, before I ran the department, I was a state um, analyst and we include P3 debt as, as state debt. We don't, we don't consider it as a um, pass through. We do include the, the right. debt of the right. state. And do you agree with DJ on the appetite for that now, given the things he said? I do agree. Yeah. How much of a problem, Eden, do you think inflation is at the moment for these uh, infrastructure projects? I do. Okay. I'm sorry, who are you asking? Well, you go first, DJ, and then and then Eden. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's enormous. And, and I think one of the, my first draft of my remarks that got going too long, I was going to talk about that a little bit, but you know, three years of inflation at the current level pretty much wipes out all the benefits of increased IIJA funding. So uh, getting inflation under that, control. That's just, that's only true on roads and bridges. 
I mean, that's just not true. I don't want to cut. I mean, I just, the bill is much more than just this, the one sector of the, that we're talking about. That's exactly right. So FRA, Federal Railroad Central, has like a 486% increase. So yeah, no, no level inflation is going to wipe that out. But as I mentioned earlier, the vast bulk of spending is on transportation. And for the transportation part of the pie, um, that will be offset. In terms of like EVs, uh, grid spending, Amtrak spend, all these spendings are whole new big chunks of money. Uh, obviously, that won't be offset because it's, you know, the existing program, the programs that don't exist now. So it's all new, new funding. Right. Um, Eden, how, what do you think? Is inflation g- give investors concern about these projects or? I think it's, the concern is, is finding the workers. It's a big issue and getting and, and, and paying their wages. I think that's a huge issue right now is finding the workers and for the governments to, to get them done. So I think that's a big issue with the inflation right now. And Shoshana, how, how big an issue is that in Colorado for you? It's significant, but it's also uneven in different areas, even within the road and bridge discipline. Like trends that we've seen you know, kind of correlate to what logic would hold, right? You know, in areas that are more rural where the workforce is more sparse, you know, you're seeing more of the constraints due to supply of people to work on the project. You know, the commodities are not all the same and can fluctuate and, you know, also often are related to sort of the location of where production occurs, you know, so depending on how far you have to move materials, that can that can fluctuate as well. Hmm. You know, I think the other thing is that there is a need to kind of control for how much we let project costs run over because of the assumption of inflation. I mean, you know, we, we are getting non-trivial pressure from parts of the industry to, you know, approve of cost overages without doing diligence on them. We're not going to, right? I mean, making sure that each time you let that happen, you cross-check it and document it and, you know, identify also whether it's worth paying for the price of inflation right now. That conversation has to happen on every single project to make sure that even in a environment with inflation, we get the best return on taxpayer investments. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm beginning to think that now anytime you have any problem with any service provider, it's always there's a supply chain problem. It can Remarkable. Be getting your coffee at a restaurant. Oh, there's a supply chain problem. It's become the all-purpose excuse. So uh, Ryan, we're almost out of time. So I wondered um, what what have we not addressed that you think is important for people in the community that we're, of people we've assembled for this conference to think about in terms of how you're implementing the IIJA, if anything. Look, I think, the, I think Eden uh, just kind of hit, hit one of the points. I mean, there are two things that are kind of universal that come up in every conversation we have, whether it's a public sector agency at the federal government level, state or local government, uh, contracting community, private sector, and, and there are two, work, workforce, 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 and then um, you know local, uh, technical capacity and just skill to be able to execute uh, federal contracting, particularly at the lo- for low capacity communities, um, small towns, community, uh, rural uh, America, um, where we're really trying to make sure that these dollars reach the places that need it the most. Um, and, and there's a lot of that. So we're very focused on uh, a couple core uh, workforce pipelines um, in the broadband space, electricians for all the various components that go through uh, there and then, you know, the, the general construction and building trades is one where, um, you know, we just we have a, a, a declining workforce overall, and we have this huge increase in investment over the next uh, decade, and uh, we're all going to have to figure it out. This is not a federal government problem, or solu- and there's not going to be a federal government solution. It's very regional. It's very uh, occupation specific, even smaller than sector specific. Um, and so we're, we're going to have to have really some local regionalized approaches uh, right. to move forward. So that I want to thank Eden, Shoshana, Ryan, and DJ for uh, an interesting conversation. And I want to thank everybody who participated in the conference overall. Uh, we are going to send around a survey monkey. We're interested in your advice on how we can do this better in the future, hopefully someday in person in the future, even though broadband seems to work at least for three out of four people on the call. Um, And with that, uh, thank you all. And on behalf of the Brandeis, Wash U, uh, the Harris School at Chicago, I wanna thank my colleagues at Brookings, Megan Waring, Howen Chen, and Stephanie Sensula for helping us run this so smoothly. And we'll see you next year, if not before. Thanks guys. Thank you.